Hey, how you doing? I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome. Welcome to my world. Welcome to TalkNet, where we do talk about you, your life, your hopes, your ambitions, your dreams, the things that make you so very special. So sit down, relax. If you're driving, do me a kindness, huh? Pay attention to the seatbelt and give the other guy a break. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. Our telephone number from anywhere in North America, 800 743 800 Alrighty, to Motortown or Motown, Detroit, Michigan. Hello. Hi there, Bruce. Hello, sweetheart. How are you? Oh, very good. Bruce, since I started to listen to you, I always wanted to ask if you would ever run for president so all of your listeners could vote you well, in. Aren't you? Well, you see, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I fooled them twice. I got to my local governing body, even got to be a mayor for a while. But that was enough for me. Well, what you're doing now may be even more valuable. I hope so. Bruce, I have a question about my hopeful career in the future. Yeah, what you doing now? Well, I'm a student. I'm uh, uh, studying mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And it looks like I am going to graduate. Well, son of a gun, you're fooling them too, huh? Yeah. But, Bruce, I'm going to be 49 years old when oh, I graduate. My goodness gracious. One foot in the <laughs> grave, the other foot in the banana peel. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think we can handle that. Go ahead. Well, I'm thinking that uh, since it takes about five or ten years to even educate a, an engineer once you're hired into a company i don't know if my job prospects are going to be very good does it take that long well i've, I've heard that uh yeah i've heard that that number mm. so i'm wondering how to market myself i'm wondering uh i don't think i can get into the uh big three here in detroit no hardly it's a, a, i think maybe you're gonna have to start thinking about small practice or going to business for yourself yeah being, being very realistic yes but uh as a as a mechanical engineer straight out of school, I'm not too sure if I could market myself in the technical uh, area that I'm interested in, in, in mechanical engineering, because I wouldn't have sufficient... Uh, well, where did you, wh why did you choose that discipline? Just wanted to know about how things came together, how, well, how, what was the difference between uh, nothing and, and matter and non-matter, and I, I went from chemistry to uh, mechanical engineering. Well, where do you, I mean, you must have had some kind of career goals in mind. Yeah, I, I uh, have worked as uh, an engineering technician in the past, about eight years ago, and I was in a bad accident, and I've got most of the uh, surgeries behind the accident uh, behind me now, but it's I've been eight years out of the workforce, and I don't see that I can even use much of that experience uh, once I graduate. I don't know what to tell you. I think you were going to be a tough hire. Yeah. Oh, I think that's the unfortunate. You have to keep slugging it out and hoping somebody recognizes that you have something to offer. But, you know, you, you are a non-traditional student. You predict you, you, you picked kind of a non-traditional area. And by your defi definition, which may or may not be accurate, one where it takes a, a significant period of time to mature. Right. Mature into the job. I don't mean to imply that you're immature. Yeah, I've got my, my head uh, on my shoulders pretty straight. I've got my family grown, so those are two advantages there. Mm -hmm. And I also know the focus within mechanical mechanical engineering that I want to... Well, well let, me, I, I, let, let me suggest something before I let you go. All right. That maybe you better be a very broad in what you are uh, interested in, in getting involved with. Uh, Bruce, what do you think about uh, if I can't find the uh, the permanent uh, full-time job as a degreed engineer, do you think it'd be a major mistake to just try to get a job as a, a technician? Or what something? did I just say? You said a, a broad person. Absolutely. Whatever comes along. Yes. Get on a payroll. Don't be picky, I guess, is a, uh -huh. is a less sophisticated way of saying it. <laughs> okay, then. I, I because won't, uh, being picky is not something you can afford just now. No. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it then. I'm just going to... Graduate and start looking now for a job. Yeah. I do wish you well, okay, dear. thanks a lot. Take good care. I hope things work out real well. If for any reason you would like a tape of this or other talk that presentations, $6.95 will do it for you. A check or money order to Lion Recording, P.O. Box 962, Washington, D.C., 20044. Please tell them two things. The time you heard the program and, of course, the date that you heard. Let me see. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Here's some... Lincoln, Nebraska. Hello there. 
Hello, Bruce. Hello, baby. I listen to you every night. Well, thank you very, very much. Great way to fall asleep. Oh, oh, I put you right to sleep, huh? Ah, <laughs> uh, well. Not every night. But uh, anyway, about four days ago, I got a telephone call uh, from a gentleman who told me that I was um, in 12% of the population in my area that was going to receive six magazines for no charge. Yeah, hold on. Ex- Pardon you be- me? You, you believe in the man with the whiskers coming down your chimney? <laughs> well, anyway, um, story, How about the Easter Bunny? His story was that it was going to cost me $3.48 a week. Well, wait a minute. I thought you are getting for no charge. Well, this is what he told me. For 60 weeks, and this is for processing. Oh, for processing, yes. Right. I was uh, let's, just work the, let, let's work that out. Okay. Three dollars and how much? Forty-eight cents a week. Well, let's make it three fifty for the sake of this. Okay. Times ten weeks is thirty-five dollars, right? Right. And that would be times six. Thirty-five seventy, one hundred and forty, one hundred and seventy-five dollars. Right. That's not hardly for free, is where I'm looking at it. Right. Or if you like, let me give you my address if you want to send me a check for <laughs> for free for 175 bucks, okay. less a dollar twenty. That that's sixty cents, so we can make it 170, right. 173 eighty. So anyway, uh, I didn't have the nerve to tell them no. You did. And uh, on the telephone? Well, how much nerve does it take to say no on the phone? Bruce, you're talking to me, and I don't have time to describe who I am. You're a wimp. Yes, I am. Okay. I am. But anyway, uh, when I told my husband what had happened, he said, do you realize you've been um, probably been uh, recorded and they can come back to you and get that money? Nonsense. They won't be able to. Well, I don't know about that. How long ago did this happen? About four days, and they said it would take about six weeks to process and for me to start getting the magazine. All right, let me see. In that four days, did they call you on a weekend? Uh, let's see. It would have been a, yes, a weekend. In that case, you still have, well, your three-day right of rescission might be might be exhausted. I don't know. I would quickly write to them tomorrow and say I have changed my mind. You didn't, did you give them a credit card or anything? Oh, no. All right. You st- no. That, 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 that you misunderstood, and upon reflection, uh, you have you can't afford what they're offering, and blah, 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 blah. Or you could write, or you could write and say, "Look, I'm I'm writing as, as my my sister. I understand made some kind of a commitment to you on the phone. Unfortunately, um, she was home on leave from a local sanitarium." <laughs> <laughs> if I gave them the wrong num- uh, address, if I gave them the wrong address, is that going to matter? I don't know. I would just write to them and say, "Please withdraw my uh, that that I was misled." Tell me, tell me that you feel that you were misled, that you were told there was something free and. Uh, now you, you've, you've concluded that it has to be paid for, and as a consequence, you have absolutely no interest in their offer. And, if and I don't every know who and the people are. You don't even know who they are. They didn't give me their name. Well, prepare that letter, and as soon as you get something from them, shoot it off to them. Okay. You didn't okay. get their name, and from now on, look. Um, how old are you? I don't think I want to tell you. Yeah, how old are you? Thirty-nine. Oh, you're just a youngster. I want you to feel it right over the top of your head right now. Uh-huh. And kind of run down the little hole behind your neck, and what do you feel there? Uh, a little beyond, a little like down below your in, into your shoulders. Get your head behind your arm behind your back. What do you uh, feel? The backbone. That's the one. <laughs> I want to get a little starch in that backbone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you got it. Thank Go- you. Good luck, dear. Poplar Buffs, Missouri. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hi. Fan, first time caller. Well, I'm very happy you're here. What's up? Well, I'm thinking about going back to college, and I wanted to get your opinion if the degree I'm working on would do me any good. How old are you? I'm 35. When you said you're going back. That's the reason I... It's okay. Yeah. And what do you do for a living? Well, I work for state government in a mid-management position. What can you tell me a little more... Be a little more definitive? Uh, yes, uh, I work for a health program, and my job is to deal with all administrative aspects, budgeting... Anything but personnel. And how much how much education do you have now? I have a bachelor's degree in political science and a bachelor's degree in history. Hmm. And what would you go back and you get a master's in some discipline? What? Well, I was thinking about um, going back and getting a BS in accounting instead of a master's. Hmm. Um, I think you'll, you'll have more bachelor's degrees and please have dogs or dogs have fleas or something. I've taken some classes in accounting. I've had nine hours in accounting, six hours of business law, and I need about about a year's worth of going straight through. What do you? What would you do with that? Well, 
what I would really like to do is to work in an administrative position, more like what I'm doing now, just more responsibility and hopefully higher pay. Mm-hmm. I'm having trouble. The organization I'm in has very restrictive promotional policies, and I really can't move up there. And I'm having trouble convincing people outside of government that you can hire someone out of government into the private sector. Mm-hmm. And um, that's kind of my situation. Hmm. How long have you been working for the government? 11 years. Yeah, that's a problem, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's not a great credential. No, it really is. And I was kind of surprised when I went on the job market. Hmm. Do you, you Are you persuaded that you want to work for somebody else? Um, I would consider going in business for myself. Well, the reason I, I mentioned that, you said you want to go into accounting, and that is an area where, where one can practice, and you don't have to have a, a be certified. You can be a public accountant and, and, and do, you know, the books and, and whatever, and taxes for small concerns and individuals without a certification. Well, um, you're talking about if I had the accounting degree. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about going back to school. Right, and if I did, I would work to get the CPA, which I believe I could get that. All right, but what I'm trying to get to is that, that you're still probably going to have to go out and, and create your own job. Okay. You're, you're, as I said, the credential of public service, I mean, you want me to stroke you or tell you the truth? I want to know the truth. Well, you know, you, you've yeah, been out there and you've found out what the truth, the facts are. Mm-hmm. It is not highly regarded in the public sector, in the private sector. Is that not true? That's very true. Yeah. And for some possible part of its perception, and maybe part of it is for good reason. For my personal perceptions, both. Mm-hmm. So you would you would recommend if I pursue accounting to consider maybe going to business for myself? Well, do you heard the last caller that she went back to school and got a degree or getting a degree in mechanical engineering? Yes. Now, that's all very well, and she may be top in her class kind of thing. But the realities are, she's going to be very hard. But the realities are, it's going to be very hard for her to find a job. Mm-hmm. And you're you're bumping up against the same realities. Okay. But that doesn't that, that you know that doesn't mean that you can't go out and, and start your own firm and do extraordinarily well. Okay. Okay, thank you, Bruce. That's good advice. Hey, knock him dead, kid. Okay, thanks a lot. Alrighty, Canton, Mass. Hello there. Hello, hello. Miami, your turn. Hello. Hello. Hi there, Bruce. I miss. I lost you for a couple of years. I've been listening to you for a long time, but I just found you recently on another station, and it's good to hear your voice. Well, thank you very much. I have a little situation that I'd like to ask your advice on. I took my car in to, um, I guess it's a franchise. It's a nationally known name um, of... of a service station organization that does um, brake repair jobs mm-hmm. about a week ago and while the car was in their possession after they had completed the work uh, one of their employees rammed another customer's van into my car mm, doesn't that throw you yeah um, and what was interesting is they didn't tell me that it had been done I was actually sitting in the waiting room while this was happening <laughs> you saw it didn't know it was going on hmm. and they told they called my name and said this will be X amount of dollars uh, the work was completed I paid for it uh, said not a word to me and as I walked out to the car I was surprised that the manager of the store walked out with me and lo and behold there's this ni- nice great big fender bender in my car a ding a ding um, he said not to worry we will take care of it uh, go and get two uh, different estimates for the repair, one of which we'd like you to go to XYZ Garage, and don't worry, we'll take care of it. So I went directly to the garage that they recommended, plus another one, and got an estimate, uh, and the, the damage is for a little under $800. Mm-hmm. Um, but since then, they don't seem to want to return my phone calls. Well, why don't you hop in your little wheels and drive down and meet them eyeball to eyeball? Okay, what would you suggest I do? I'd say I'm here. I'm here. Let's let's ante up, pony up. I'd go with a positive. Hey, my car was damaged. I went to the place. It's eight hundred bucks. Write me a check. All right. Let me. When I say they they won't return my phone calls, maybe I'm not being quite uh, accurate there. I've, I have actually spoken to them on several times on the phone, and each time they say, "Well, I have to check with my supervisor. Well, we will get back to." Well, you say this is not satisfactory. How long, is it, how long ago did this happen? About a week ago. Oh, well, a week is kind of a short period of time. 
I'd give him another week or two. Give him another week? Yeah. I mean, nothing happens in a couple of weeks these, in today's world. Okay. I mean, the ink doesn't even dry. Yeah, they're, they're saying they have to check with their insurance company and so on and so forth. Well, I doubt seriously if they, they will turn it over with their insurance company after that kind of money. I, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, that would not be the smartest thing to do in my judgment. Yeah. All right. But I, I'd give them a little more time. If if I'm getting no more luck, then what, what would then be? Then, yeah, you go down and eyeball them. And, then, of course, then <laughs> the next thing is small claims court. Yeah. Okay. Good luck, my friend. Where I are you from originally? Your Where are you from originally? I am from a little place called London, England. I, why did I think that there just might be uh, a little of Great Britain in there someplace? <laughs> Golly, I, boy, what a perceptive guy I am. Hey, you're not the first one, but it probably won't be the last either. <laughs> Take good care, guy. You too. All righty. Where are we going, Danny? Fort Worth. Hello there. The Metroplex South, I guess. Hello. Hey, Fort Worth, are you there? I sure am. Hi, well, Bruce. Hi. You're driving me sane. Oh, <laughs> we'll drive you to think. That's the thing. <laughs> What's happening? Well, listen, I'm going to sell my house. And I've heard you say many times, any time you buy a house, have a lawyer. Yeah. Do I need to have Absolutely. a lawyer myself? Absolutely. The lawyer that the title company furnishes will not be my lawyer? Not in my opinion, no. Okay. No, sir. Why do I need a lawyer to sell? Because how much are you selling this thing for? Uh, about 135 Well, I mean, I, I mean, let me retract that. I mean, if you're selling a little chump change house like that, 135 grand. I mean, who needs, you know, please. You ever see 135000 bucks in cash? No. It's a lot of money. Yeah, I know it is. It's a lot of money. All it takes is one minor error. And you're going to be, uh, once again, signing up on, for example, do you know what representation is? Do I know what? Or what a representation is. No. Hmm. Well, it's when you, when you make a statement about your house. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I well, understand. You can make the wrong representation, and six months from now, they're going to come after your lungs. Okay. Your attorney will be guiding you in that regard. All right. Uh, there's going to be what are called adjustments at a closing. Do you know what that means? It's where you, for example, if you pay the taxes for, the lab, uh, for a quarter, and there's 36 days in that quarter remaining, you get an adjustment for that, right? Right. Who's going to do that calculation and be certain it's accurate? And that you're not being shortchanged in any way. Who's going to calculate and, and, and prove the figures for the mortgage to be certain that it's an accurate payoff? Well, I know I'm not. <laughs> well, it's a cinch. I don't. That's why I hire professionals. And, you know, it's, it's rather like buying a parachute. If, if the guy screws up, and I use the word guy gentlessly, clearly. Yes. But if that individual screws up, guess who I'm going after? Okay. Them. Yeah. No, I just think when you're buying and, buying and selling real estate, unfortunately, well, maybe that's a poor choice of terms, but it is a very complicated task. You know, you're going to be signing your name. I, I think you can agree on this. You'll be signing your name dozens of times. Each of those documents was constructed and written by an attorney, not necessarily somebody in your corner. I want somebody to interpret from me. Good luck, guy. I'm Bruce. This is Talk. Manhattan, New York. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Maybe you can help me. I'll do my very best. What's happened in the Big Apple? Uh, we were planning to move to San Diego. We That's went a... and visited San Diego, and because we have a dog and a cat, we were having a hard time finding an apartment. Mm -hmm. We found one, and the one that we liked, we decided that when we got back to New York, we sent them a deposit saying that we were planning to move there in a year or so. A year? Yeah. Well, Boy, talk about plan ahead. <laughs> yeah, well, because we have uh, animals, it's a problem. Uh, nobody wants to rent you an apartment with a uh, an animal. Well, I'm not sure if that's true, but go ahead. Well, it was hard anyway. It's more so. difficult. We can agree on that. Right. Well, right now we've decided not to move to San Diego. Uh -huh. And we called asking for the return of our deposit, and they won't return it. Well, I don't blame them. Why not? Well, what do you? Why did you send a deposit? Because we, if we were going to live uh, there, that, wait a minute. You sent a deposit to seal a deal. But they weren't holding an apartment for. But, us. but they, but they agreed to rent you one though. They agreed to rent us, and that we. All right, stop, stop, them. stop right there. They agreed to rent you an apartment. Right. 
So they did something of value to you, and you in turn gave them something of value, money. Right. Well, then now all of a sudden you want to walk away from the deal. But they didn't hold an apartment. But it doesn't matter. They've agreed to do something, and right. they're prepared to carry out their agreement. You in turn are not prepared to carry out your end of your bargain. But it was contingent upon us moving there. No, no, no. Well, obviously it's contingent on you going there to move in. But you've asked them to do something, and they're saying, yeah, we're ready, willing, and able. Now, if that wasn't uh, the case, then there'd be no need for you to write a deposit check. Deposit check is to ensure that they do something that's been previously agreed upon, and that you will do something previously agreed upon. Now, they're willing to do theirs. And you Even don't though we had called them and repeatedly through this saying that we weren't sure when, in that is well in that case they'll say we'll hold your money you want to move out here in, in 2009 we're willing to talk that's what a deposit is all about sweetheart well the deposit was mm, mm. I agree with you well, well, well show me give me some logic to disagree well because they didn't do anything yes they did what did they do they agreed to rent you an apartment right but that's it stop they did something they agreed to rent you an apartment. Now, when we call them, they don't say that. They just say, yes, we will return your deposit, but then they don't. Well, that's a different story. Okay, well, that's what they say. Well, in that case, I don't know how much money is involved. $500. Yeah, forget it. Well, that's the point that I know. It doesn't pay for us to go there. No. I just feel that um, they should be put on record someplace. Well, if they if they said that, you see, they, they, what they said, they didn't have to say. They could just say, we're keeping this as liquidated damages. That would be their answer. Right, but they've never said that. Well, okay. They Every just keep, time keep... we call, uh, my husband calls and they say, uh, oh, yeah, my father forgot to do it or the bookkeeper forgot. To... All right. Well, you keep calling them, you may get somewhere, but you, legally there's not much you're going to do about it. But understand, it was a cheap, you got a cheap lesson. You don't give deposits unless you intend to perform because a deposit is a two-edged sword. It is designed to see that both parties uh, perform. That's the purpose of a deposit. The one who accepts the deposit agrees to perform. The one who gives the deposit agrees to perform. And that's what the, that's the, that's why it's given. I do wish you well, lover. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talkman. Let's go down to Danbury. Before I go to Danbury, let me remind you, I'm not going anywhere at quitting time. Yeah, we'll be here from 10 p.m. right through 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. 800 743 Okay, Danbury, go for it. How you doing, Bruce? Good, thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, let's see. I guess, first of all, I uh, just want to tell you I'm a long-time listener, a first-time caller. Yes, sir. And uh, I've got a piece of property, a two-acre piece of property, um, having a little bit of trouble selling it. Okay. When you uh, say property, I take it unimproved. Uh, that is correct. Okay, go ahead. All right. Now, I've got a uh, general contractor who is interested in building a spec home on my property mm -hmm. without buying my property. Okay, yeah. with an agreement. You'll have to subordinate your, pro your, your interest then to the bank's interest. Okay. Right? Uh, well, I own the property. Yes, but you'll have to subordinate your interest in the... When he, when, they, when he puts up a spec house, he's got to borrow the money to put it up, I'm sure. Okay. So you'll have to subordinate your interest to the lender's interest. That's very foolish. Okay, there's no way I can tell him. Uh, in other words, I don't want to give up that right. Well, you, but you see... You don't have the choice. It, he, That's well, what you're telling he me. He doesn't have the, the, the ability to build the house without borrowing the money. Okay. And the lender wants first whack... So you're going to have to, it's called subordinating your rights to the lender. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I I wouldn't would. either. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Well, the alternative, I don't like that very much either. But you, you, you build a, do you own the property free and clear? I do. Well, you can always build a spec house. I wouldn't recommend it, but it's certainly an alternative. You know, I wasn't uh, really excited about putting out that money uh, uh -huh. myself. How much money you got tied up in the, in the property? Uh, about 32. Mm -hmm. 
I've got it marketed for sixty, and that's what he's agreeing to buy it for. Well, he was going to put ten thousand dollars down. Yeah. When the spec house sells, then I get the remaining balance. Mm -hmm. But you are at risk. Suppose he builds a spec house and can't sell it. I understand that. Well, the way I looked at it. He, I would have a spec house sitting on my property. Well, the the only way there's only one way to put your first name. Kent. Kent, there's only one way you could protect yourself in that in that eventuality. Okay. Let's buy the house. Ah. Uh, well, let me. Well, you see, you know, that's a possible. I'm just telling you what, what your op what your options are. All right. He builds a spec house. You subordinate it, which would make me uncomfortable. But let's assume you do that. Worst case scenario, he goes sour. Then you would have to step in and have the wherewithal to bid out the. Uh, the property to either your equity as well as the whatever it costs to retire the debt for the house plus expenses or alternatively you wind up with a house okay bill that alternative doesn't look too pretty either Bruce. <laughs> well the third is just to sit tight and try to sell to somebody else with less money not much fun dean everett is our stellar engineer of the evening mr walter hassett is our master control type person paul hill the operations manager and there's some kid named rudd hanging around there the producer hey glad to have you guys to work with remember tonight 10 p.m through 3 a.m we'll be here i'm bruce williams for talk Dad. well hello there hey i am delighted you bopped in i'm bruce williams welcome my friends welcome to Talknet, where we do chat with you about you and your life, your hopes, your ambitions, your dreams, the things that make you so incredibly special. Very, very happy you're here. I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome to Talknet. The telephone number from anywhere on the continent, 800 743 You know that number, 800 743 Good right now. Danny says we have a line or two open. Or if you prefer, 10 o'clock this evening through 3 a.m. tomorrow morning. Fair enough? Give me a shout. 800 Seven four three eight thousand. Columbus, Ohio. You're at the head of the line. Hello there. Yes, Bruce. I uh, was listening to your program, and a lot of things are on my mind that I need to get some advice on. Well, shall we talk? Okay. Uh, I'm an independent contractor with a company that supplies products for fundraising, and so I set up my office with a friend, and uh, I have I had a laptop, and he didn't have a computer, so I went ahead and put my personal computer in his home. And he went ahead and got a phone established in his in his home. Mm -hmm. And what happened was, as the time progressed over a few months or so, I began to question his his dealings with. Uh, he was handling the invoices and things of this nature. So were you guys kind of partners in this operation? Uh, well, he wasn't really a partner because he was. Um, his situation was he was on SSI, so he was trying to recover from some previous situations. What do you mean previous situations? Well, he'd, he'd had problems with. Uh, uh, abuse of substance abuse and things of that nature. Well, he was and, a junkie. Was a junkie? Uh, alcohol. Well, it was a combination of alcohol and uh, uh, prescription drugs. Well, that's a junkie, whether it's prescription <laughs> or not. But uh, he, had, he had been off of, off of it for a while, and, of course, I was trying to to get some things going myself, and hopefully down the road I was going to have him working with me if, if the thing would have taken off. Mm -hmm. And it was starting to make some progress, actually. But then what happened was he started doing things behind the back, um, wasn't up front with me as far as the invoices, invoices and expenses and things of this nature. Mm. So I started uh, calling his hand on what was happening and um, found out that I had a, that the fund was put in my name at his home. Yeah. And uh, about a $250 phone bill. Yeah. And now he says that he bought the computer off of him. And I thought I knew the guy, but I guess I... Well, clearly you didn't. Yeah, lessons to be learned, I guess. Yeah, I'm afraid that's true. So my question is, as far as uh, recourse, um, what I'm going to have to do, I guess, to get what's rightfully mine, plus uh, let him pay what he owes. Well, I'm not sure you're going to get him to pay what he owes. Let's start with that. The computer, uh, it's in his house as we speak. Yes. And he says that you sold it to him? Yeah, he claims that I sold it and that his wife would verify it, yet... Uh, I know I didn't sell to him, and of course there's no written receipts or anything of that nature because I didn't sell it to him. Well, the phone bill is in your name, but the phone is at his address. Uh, it's at his address, and I did discover, I believe, it's his social security number that he gave because 
it didn't match up with my social security well, number. The point is, did, did, did you ever sign any kind of an application for the telephone? Uh, no, I didn't. Yeah, but, my understanding was he called it in. But, but, did you, but you did use it. Uh, yes, we did. Because no, where, hold it. But I said here. you. Did you use it? Uh, Not we. Did you use it? Yes, at times I was at his house using it, and uh, I did. I was willing to pay for a long distance calls at that point for uh, business purposes. I think you're going to have to pay for the phone bill. I'd have it turned off tomorrow. Oh, I've already got to shut off and get the phone and everything pulled out. Uh, in that case, I'd pay the bill. As far as the, how much is the computer worth? Um, the computer, was, if I would sell, it would be 800 because it's, I've got the desk, the computer, monitor, and the whole nine yards with it. Well, that, but that was what you paid for it? Uh, no, I paid more than that, actually, but I'm just figuring the depreciation. Of what did you pay for it? I paid probably around twelve to thirteen hundred. I have uh, to look. It's at probably worth about three hundred bucks then. Oh, is it? Not that kind of money. Well, what I'm trying to get to it. Is it worth pursuing, or you just write the thing off? Well, um, the guy. Look, look. Let's start with the premise. The guy is he's a he's, he's not the most sterling character to begin with. He's trying to steal from you. Now the question is: Is it worth pursuing? That's the whole question here. We're talking about probably let's let's be generous and say six hundred dollars, the telephone bill and the computer. Okay. Is it worth spending eating your heart out and whatever and spending maybe some money and effort and time for six hundred bucks? That's the question to be resolved. Yeah. If I went to a small claims court, I'm wondering if it would be that much. Well, but a small claims court for what? Uh, no, for, I, no, I mean you, you have to have a dollar. You're going to say you stole my computer, therefore I'm going to pay. I have receipts on stuff to show what I paid. But that isn't the issue. Okay. The issue is he is illegally. You see, it's not a question of a of a civil debt here. He stole it from you. That's not a small claims matter. Okay. As I see it. That's why I'm not. That's what I'm saying. I'm not sure how. This well, works. I don't know either. I might. I might could be dead wrong, but it looks to me like he stole it from you. Well, yeah. Basically, that's what he's doing. Not, no, no. But what, what that was that word you used? Basically. That's not the. Basically, there's no place here. Okay. He's stealing it from you. Okay. The question is, is it worth screwing around with? Well, um, I don't. It's a good question. How much is your time worth? How much is how much effort can you put into this? If it were me, I would go rap on his door and say, "I want my computer." Well, I have let him know that already. No. I, well, how'd you let him know? On the telephone? No, I went face to face. And what did he say? And he's that's what he told me that he he paid for it and his, his wife would witness it and all that kind of stuff. I went to his house. And he just about not refused to give it to you. Right, that's correct. Well, the question is, do you want to go to the district attorney's office and say this guy refuses to give up your equipment, he's stealing it? That's where I have way out the time, the cost factor on it, yeah. Well, and also the aggravation. Exactly. That's Good luck, kid. <laughs> okay. There's a lesson there. St. Paul, Minnesota, hello. Uh, good evening, Bruce. Good evening. Uh, my, my wife and I listen to you quite often, and we have a, a problem here. We need another opinion on it. Well, shall we try? All right. Uh, we were thinking of doing a, an adoption, an international adoption. Mm -hmm. I'm 41, and uh, she's 46. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you, you, we the, borrowed the money. The chances are you would not be allowed to domestically adopt. Right, we were thinking because, of the because, Philippines. That's well, no, I mean because of your age. Right, it's it's even trouble there because they don't want more than forty years in between the youngest parent and, and the child. And we were thinking of getting a, an infant. Forty? Oh, I see. Forty. Okay, so if you had a, I I'm, understand. I'll be forty-one later this. Yeah, month. but your wife is the real problem. Yeah, that's that's true. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, problem. I you know I'm using that word in <laughs> in the context that it's offered. You understand? Mm -hmm. But uh, the. Agency here, the fee is twenty seven hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and we we borrowed the money, mm -hmm. and the application application fee, which we've already done, is three fifty. Mm -hmm. And before we go on with this, <laughs> we have some credit cards at high interest rates, and we're kind of teetering back and forth whether we should continue with the adoption. Well, but the question is, can you afford it? Like any other. Endeavor, can you afford parenthood right now? Mm -hmm. How much do you guys earn? Uh, about 45000 How come you're so far in hock? Well, the, the credit cards we're thinking about are only $4,000. Yeah. How much money do you got in the bank? Cash? Uh, not very much. We have more in the IRA, 401k. Yeah, but that's retirement money. We're, gonna, we're, we're not going to touch that. I mean, I'm just curious why you guys haven't stashed a little money away. Well, we've had job problems in the past. Mm -hmm. I was laid off 
uh, for a while in 87. Well, I guess the question is, can you afford? I mean, I don't know the viability of this agency or legitimacy of the agency or, or reliability. I mean, those are things that you, I hope, have checked out. Yeah, the, the agency's fine. It's just, we were, the next payment would be $925. That isn't, I, the, uh, the, you know, the, you're talking about pennies next to the cost of raising a child. Mm -hmm. question is, can you afford to raise a child? Yeah, and if we, if we go to the Philippines and, and get the child, that's going to be eight or eight or $9,000 there. But Why is that? Well, we have to go over there. You know, it doesn't cost eight or nine grand to get to the Philippines. Well, and if the child is two or more, then you have to pay part of the airfare. Yeah, so? And there's there's a fee over there also. It must be a big fee. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty pretty large, too. It must be, because the airfare can't be much more than $1,000 a head. Yeah, we figured twelve fifty a piece for us. We, we were over there this last year, mm. last November. I think the big question is, can you afford a child? That's what it comes down to. Even with all the numbers you've thrown at me, that's just a down payment on raising a youngster. Mm -hmm. I do wish you well, guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. North Palm Beach, hello there. Hello, Bruce. Hello there. You bet. Uh, thank you for your, taking my call. You're very I'll welcome. try to be very concise. I'm looking, I'm soliciting your advice. Um, uh, from a family standpoint, uh, we have our insurance with uh, an agency. And uh, we have uh, two main family cars, and we have a teenager, but he's, uh, he's listed as his own uh, person, but we essentially pay for his. But my question is not so much with the cars, is the fact that our just recently received from the insurance agency uh, the personal liability umbrella policy for this next year. We've, we've carried a personal liability for the last 20 years on our home. And uh, this past year, it went from $379 to $800, $893, a $514 increase. And the reason for the increase was stated uh, claims for uninsured or underinsured motor vehicles. That was the reason why they were increasing our insurance about 150% on our personal liability insurance. My question... Well, wait, 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 wait. Did, not, did you, did you, you didn't make any claims. No, no, no. Absolutely no claims. What they're saying is their overall underwriting is suffering. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Uh, my question to you is, I'm outraged. I have called... Uh, Why are you outraged? I'm outraged at, at a $500 increase because on these three other motor vehicles, in order to carry this liability, we carry uninsured motor vehicle coverage. Yes, ma'am. Of one hundred, three hundred thousand on me. each of these three vehicles, right. which accounts for five hundred dollars a year. Right. Well, I'm not sure what you're what you're outraged about. I understand you don't like the premium to go up. Nobody does. But what they I think what they're telling you is that they've had big losses. Okay. Yes, I understand. Well, it has that. nothing to do with you. It's just that. <laughs> When the insurance companies are there to make money, and if they're going to have losses, they're going to increase their premiums until such time as the premiums cover the cost of doing business and a profit. Well, my question to you is, um, we have considered dropping the uninsured coverage on our personal liability well, umbrella Well, see, you policy. mentioned umbrella. The, uh, the uninsured motorist does not come under an umbrella coverage. Well, it does. It's, it's personal liability umbrella policy, and the first one is just personal liability for $1 million, yeah. and the second coverage is you uh, for... Uh, well, you, you have uninsured motorists on your regular policy, do you know? That's correct. $100,000, $300,000. All right. So this is giving you an extra million for your per, uh, uninsured motorists, is what you're That's telling correct. me. That's correct. For a lousy 500 bucks, I wouldn't consider dropping it. You would not? No, ma'am. 
What happens if you if some very uh, under or uninsured irresponsible person does you serious damage? Where's the money going to come from? Hello? Yes, I'm oh, I'm very much listening to you. Well, that's that's what yeah. it comes down yeah. to. As a matter of fact, if they had to raise the premium the way you've described, mm -hmm. wouldn't that alert you to the fact that they've had some heavy claims? And wouldn't that mean then that the exposure was there for somebody and, um, and the, somebody sitting there th saying, thank God we have the coverage? Uh, and, and for example, well, you carry collision insurance, right? Oh, yes, definitely. But see, that's a, in my opinion, that's, that's, that doesn't mean very much. What kind of car do you have? Uh, well, we have a 1992 um, uh, Prelude. All right, what's that worth? Uh, About. 20000 right, So the most you can lose is twenty grand. Mm -hmm. That's not much money. It would hurt you. But if you lost your income the rest of your life, it could be a half a million. That could kill you. Well, but your emphasis, you really, oh boy, you bet your life I carry that collision insurance when your liability is limited to the value of the machine. Or when you have fire insurance, the, limit, the value is limited to the stuff you have in the house or indeed to the house itself. And you wouldn't be without that. But where, you, where the big numbers are, you're thinking about dropping it. That's backwards. Uh, well, it, it does. It, it's not quite as uh, asinine as it may sound to it's you not. personally. Uh, explain why not. <laughs> uh, okay, my que my question comes from a standpoint of um, if if one has relatively good medical coverage. Yeah. Um, I, I, medical is only part of an injury. Okay. That's the okay. hospital. All right. But how about the rest of the things that aren't, aren't medic? They are medically oriented to the extent that uh, they are a result of, of injury to your bod. Uh -huh. But medical insurance is not going to cover loss of income. Okay. Well, I guess I'm wondering where does one's responsibility begin and end? At well, what the, point who's the, does... the responsibility is to you. Uh -huh. So I'm saying to you, what's your first name? June. June. Look, if I went out right now with a sledgehammer and pulverized that 92 automobile, uh -huh. you'd get over that. E easily. But you wouldn't get over a half a million dollar uh, hit on your body very easily. What I'm or a million dollar, is, or a million dollar hit on I'm your body. What I'm questioning is where, where does one um, question or how does one... Um, wonder why a household like mine has to pay a thousand dollars a year for people who don't pay coverage well june that's the way life is is there that's, no is there no recourse that's the that? way life is yeah there, there's recourse but but that your politicians are you, you could say where how come a woman like yourself you're you're let me see i've forgotten where you're calling from where, where are you north palm all right how come a woman like you can't go down to miami and walk around at two o'clock in the morning Mm -hmm. Because there was a right. time. How old are you, June? Uh, Forty-two. All right. When your mother was a young girl, she could go down there with no problem. When your mother was a youngster, she could walk down to the, the A train at Forty Second Street in Manhattan at one o'clock in the morning and be reasonably comfortable. Where have we gone wrong? Well, we've gone wrong in a lot of ways, in my opinion. We've got people. I don't even know if they 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 squashed the little bug, but there was a guy on death row. They were talking about executing the other day, but they're seventeen years, seventeen years, fifty years ago, sixty years ago. You know how long you landed on death row? A month and a half, two months, and they spend. If you were you were convicted, they did you in. No, okay. we have, but you, but you, but responsibility uh, is now shifted. You see. It used to be the good guys were taken care of. Now we're concerned with the bad guys. We're concerned with those poor people that can't pay their bills or can't, or been, they've been abused, they've been this, that, and the other thing. And you're asking how come you got to pay? Because that's what the do-gooders have done to us over the last 50 years. All right, uh, Bruce, and I'm not trying to be argumentative. That's okay. You have 30 you. seconds and be okay. argumentative as you wish. All right. Uh, what, what I'm saying is, um, uh, you know, it, it seems... Quickly. Irresponsible.
for a family to have to pay a but thousand honey, dollars. Honey, you a year. are the one who, and me and the rest of us who vote for the politicians who say, yes, we have to be compassionate, that we have to take care of these other folks, that they have to be excused. And you're going to pay for that. And you are paying, Joe. I'm Bruce for TalkNet. We're doing a sitcom, okay? But here's the good part. There's no kids in it. No kids, no neighbors, no single dads, no working moms, no nothing. We got nothing on this show. Nothing. Well, hello there. How you doing? I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to TalkNet, where, yes, we do chat with you. Unlike so many other programs that do great interviews, you'll never find that in these precincts. Just you and me against the world. Glad you're here. I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome to TalkNet. Telephone number 800 743 uh, before we get underway here, I'm going to do what I did a couple nights ago because I think it's so terribly important. And it does dovetail with what we're doing to the extent that we talk about life, your life, my life, and what affects our lives. Well, what is going on in Washington, D.C., in the minds of some of our leaders, clearly affects our lives. And in my opinion, very dramatically adversely. And I'm talking about this talk, which looks like it's reality of invading Haiti. If you agree or disagree, really doesn't matter, you should let your congressional representative know and let Mr. Clinton know what you think. In my opinion, this is an enormously, enormously foolish adventure. Why in the world are we, are we talking about Haiti? As I mentioned the other night, one of the greatest pieces of broken field running I've seen in some time was Warren Christopher on Meet the Press trying to justify his boss's position. Now, I, I'm not criticizing Mr. Christopher. He gets paid to do that. He has to justify what his boss says. That's his job as Secretary of State. But he went on, and, and uh, today, if you read the USA Today, Bob Graham, the senator from Florida, is talking about a spreading democracy in the hemisphere. What a lot of nonsense. We are not able to be the world's cop. And if no one has explained to me why Haiti is worth one single American casualty, and you know, as God made little apples, we're going to have casualties if we invade this country. For what possible purpose? There's no economic purpose. There's no militaristic purpose. There's no reason for us to get into Haiti. None. Well, 9 o'clock this evening, uh, Mr. Clinton, I think, is going to try to do a sales job, which is certainly his right and his responsibility. But it would appear that 75% of the country or more uh, suggest that this is a very, very, very bad thing to do. The only major support he's received is from the Black Political Caucus, and clearly uh, their aims are both racial and political. And they have every right to do that. But I don't see why the rest of us have every right to support it or have any obligation to support it. To spend American lives on a, on a reckless adventure, this kind of... And, and the president, here's a president who, who did not support a war and went off to foreign countries and certainly didn't serve his nation willing to send young people on such a fool's errand. Seldom have I been distressed like this. I mean, politically, I can, you know, it doesn't matter to me anymore. Democrats, Republicans, or whatever. I mean, I have friends who are on both sides and supported both sides. But this is not partisan. This is insanity. If you agree with me, let your congressional delegates know. At least you've done that. All righty, we begin in Baltimore, Maryland. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Hey, Bruce, I love your show. I learn a lot. Well, thank you so very much. I didn't mean to depart from our regular, but I, I just think this is such a... I agree with you, Bruce. ...incredible crime. Yeah. To, to, for for a nothing little island yeah. Yeah. that has no meaning to us whatsoever. Uh, it, it, there's no way in the world that we are going to stop uh, human rights violations around the world. We just aren't that strong. We don't have those kind of resources. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, Bruce, let me tell you about myself. Shoot. Um, I've been driving for approximately 14 years, mm -hmm. and I have no moving violations. You're better than me. <laughs> Because I have. But I had two accidents, one in uh, 88 and one in 87. All right. Okay, they were my fault. Uh, I guess they would be minor. So I was uh, about to ask about the severity. Okay. Um, now, Bruce, 
Those accidents are not on my MVR report. Well, they disappear after a time. No, they've never been there. Never. Hmm. Never. I, I get a copy of my uh, driving record every year. How, how do you do that? Uh, just just pay, just pay two bucks for it. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> two, do- two whole dollars. Well, it's gone up to seven this year. Oh, my goodness gracious, inflation strikes again. Yes. But, no, it's, it's never been on there. But the my insurance carrier, of course, has that information. I mean, after all, they paid out the claim. Okay? Yeah, well, I, we, but if it's the same carrier, of course. Yes, yes, same carrier. Um, uh, Bruce, I'm I'm applying to become an over-the-road truck driver. All right, okay. then you got it. Do you have an? Uh, do they call them articulated licenses now? I guess I don't there's, know. There's um, a special license that has a, it has a name. CDL. I, pardon? CDL, commercial driver's license. Okay. Okay. Um, Bruce, um, most of the companies are asking, "Have you had any accidents?" in five years what um and the two companies that i'm the most interested in and i like their benefits and their pay structure and all that other stuff and they ask for 10 years wow okay now it's not on my mvr report what should i do well you're you're saying should you lie and i can't tell you whether you should or whether you shouldn't um um, What, what would be the the uh uh, and what would happen if you, if you, or do you know the answer to this? If you, if you were straight with them, I don't know. I mean, um, you, you haven't had an accident for six years, for crying out loud. You, uh, you, you really think it's not, it's not a big deal? Well, I didn't say that. Huh? I didn't, I didn't say that. Uh-huh. I mean, it may well be that that would be held against you. I'm not in a position to say uh-huh. yay or nay, but it would seem to me that that I would be, I would be straight with them. Because okay. you know, you know, doggone well. If it, if first of all, if you've had these accidents, uh-huh. if I want to find out, you say it's not in the MV records, right? Yeah, it's not in the MV records. Right. Hear me out. Mm-hmm. But it could very well be in uh, Equifax's records, uh-huh. TransUnion's records, and they very well may subscribe to these services for what's called a personnel selection report. And you can bet your life and, and, and firstborn kid, if you lie to them on two occasions like that, you're going to be history. And furthermore. Uh, well, it's not proper to blackball people. You're going to be blackballed. Uh huh. Okay. I'm, I don't. Uh, I don't think I would risk that. Okay. So, um, so, um, you know, uh, do you, uh, do you think my chances would be would would be bad if I if I told them? I don't know that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I think the, the 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 risk. If you told me you say that there was a condition that absolutely positively you'll never work. Say, well, you got, you'll do what you consider is necessary to get the job done. That would be one set of circumstances, but that's not the case here. Uh huh. We don't know. And, and maybe, uh, are you in a position to make some inquiries? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, oh, yeah. I can. I can just call them up and not give my name. Well, I'm not yeah. sure that. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd be quite so direct. Uh huh. Do you know guys that work for the company? Uh huh. Do uh, you? No, I don't. I'm asking the Could you find someone who works? Oh, yes, yeah. I'd like. I, I'd want to know if you could find out a little bit of what their attitude has been in the past. Uh-huh. That might that might <laughs> tell you what you ought to do or what you might want to consider doing. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Bruce. There's no absolutes here that I know of. I'll I'll put them down. I'll put them down. I'll I won't lie. There you go. Yeah. I wish you well. Good. Sad, oh, b- b- safety Harbor, Florida. Hello there. Hello, Bruce. It is I in the flesh. Hi. I just got to tell you, I've been listening to you for years, and I love your show. I've learned a hell of a lot. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I've been wanting to call uh, numerous times with business questions, but uh, I need your opinion on something else right now. Um, The best way to probably describe this is uh, give you a hypothetical situation. All right. Um, Let's say that I'm selling you a -a one-of-a-kind widget. All right. It weighs about one in the ki- one of a kind. One of a kind widget uh, weighs about fifteen pounds, and it fits in a two foot square box. You're going to pay me seven hundred dollars for it. The problem is, you live in Florida, and I live in Texas. How do we make this transaction where we both feel safe with our uh, money and our product? There really isn't any way. No. Somebody is going to somebody has got to have a certain amount of trust here. Yeah. Other words, uh, for example, let's let's extend this this widget thing. Is is a is this a widget that could be broken in transit? 
Um, not too easily. Is it a widget that could not operate properly? What kind? What are you shipping? Give me some it's ideas. It's an intake manifold for a car, but All it's right. a rare one. All right, it's fine. It's not one that I can find around here. Okay. And you're saying that the uh, the uh, supplier, you don't even know the supplier. It's it's a pr it's a private party. And they're not going to send it through well, some, somebody. Well, well, they could send it COD, but the problem with that scenario is it could be an empty box. Yeah. You don't get to open the box. But again, on, they're on, sending it without having their money yet. Well, I understand that. But I'm looking at it first from your perspective, and yeah. the other side of it is that, uh, as you pointed out, they send the thing. How far away is this little rascal? Um, You're in Florida. It's in Texas. <laughs> you said that's right. That's a long hike. Yeah, it's not something. Well, I let me ask this of you. There. Can you? Pardon me. It's not something that I could just drive over and pick. Well, up. you could, but it'd be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I hope you don't have any problems sitting down. <laughs> now, the the other side of that, let me ask you this: uh, How much? How much is seven hundred bucks? You said? Yeah, seven hundred. <sighs> well, you could ask him at least for a reference or two. Do you have a bank that you bank with pretty regularly? Yeah. All right. Ask him for a bank reference. Okay. Somebody who knows him in the banking business. All right. And then have your guy at your bank call his bank All right. and say look I got a client here this guy's your client is he straight does he do it do you understand what I'm saying yeah bankers uh -huh. will be candid with each other right now, I'm not telling you that's foolproof yeah I was, it, I was just wondering I don't know how much you know about these uh, like the shipping uh, businesses that package and ship. What, what does that got to do with anything well I was wondering if they would work in coordination with like a uh, um, uh, a you telephone, mean, what am I trying to think of, like well, a Western Union type of thing, <laughs> where you could call them up and they would be like a holder of the money and they would ship it. Well, that's, a, that, that's an interesting concept. In other words, you're saying they could take it, what, what, what's the name of it? There's a couple of those out there, Post Boxes USA. Yeah, and, well, something like that. Uh, I just looked at one of those today. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. What you're saying was, okay, uh, you take it down to the shipping place. Right. And as soon as I talk to them on the phone, and they say, yeah, it's in their possession, and just I in their possession, them. you will then wire the money to him. Right. I suppose. I, I think I'd be tempted to go the route that I described to you. Yeah. I get hold of a banker and uh, ask him to call his counterpart in, in, in Texas and see if the guy has one. Yeah. And just ask him to give you a reference for the guy. Yeah. There's okay, no, well, but there's nothing absolute here. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, I appreciate your opinion. Thanks. This is something that happens regularly, and you, you raise a very good point. Yeah. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. We're off. We're running to Utica, New York. Hello there. Utica, are you there? I'm there. Well, Hi, I'm Bruce, here. You're you? there. We're together. Let's get it on. Got a, got a small problem here. I thought maybe you could help us out. Well, we can do our very best. Uh, my wife and I purchased a small lakefront camp back in May. All right. And we had ideas of doing lots of uh, you know, major reconstruction on it in addition. You had ideas. Is that a past tense? Well, we still have the ideas. Got soured a little bit. We're still moving forward with them. So we, we sought the assistance of an architect to help us out with the drawings and design. And we, we met one at a home show talked with him and then through other various inquiries the same name came up so we gave him a call and had him out here and he took a look at the house and on his first visit out he went over his fee schedule <laughs> <laughs> boy that was exciting yeah so you know we told him we had x number of dollars to work with right. and what we wanted him to do with x number of dollars uh -huh. and he says you know no problem he says his fee was going to be six percent of the budgeted amount that also included, our house is on piers right now. That also included our budget was to have some type of either partial or full foundation put in underneath. Mm -hmm. so right he, now it's just sitting up there on these little jobbies, huh? Right now we're just sitting on cinder blocks. Yeah, that's not too cool. Yeah. So he also stated that um, seeing that the foundation work would be done by an outside contractor, that the 6% would be the budgeted amount minus whatever the foundation work was going to cost. Well, you say, well, isn't the architect going to have outside contractors as well? No, no. The architect's only job was to um, verify 
existing dimensions and you know building materials and come up with the, the blueprints for the future design. Well, the I think that he's a little high. Oh, you think he's a little high? Well, usually when you hire an architect, you do it for two reasons. You hire him for what you've described. Right. You also hire him to supervise at least uh, a topical supervision of the job. No, we, we made it clear from the beginning that we wanted the uh, we wanted the, the stamped blueprints and that the rest of the process of construction, we were going to be in the contractor in and we would sub it out to, you know, whoever we saw fit. Mm, okay. And he had no problem with that. Well, I'm sure he wouldn't. So, you know, we proceeded on with that and, you know, the first meeting went well. He came back with the second meeting with a, a rough, rough picture of what he thought we could do with the house and we looked it over and decided we wanted to, you know, make a few minor modifications with the second floor, uh, go five feet further out on an addition in the back instead of the 10 feet he had suggested and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So he, he made a few more notes and uh, went back to his office and at our next meeting he had what was the, the house that were the, the picture that we ended up with now with a few exceptions that we rearranged the interior a little bit. Mm -hmm. So anyways, like two months later we get to the, the final meeting. He calls me up and says, the prints are already. I can come pick them up. I show up at his office and he's stamping them and signing them and we sit down and he goes, now, you know, all we have to do is discuss our fee. And he goes, you know, what were you expecting the fee to be? And I repeated what he said at our initial meeting, that it would be the 6% of our budgeted amount. What was the budgeted amount? We told him for $40,000 that we wanted to, to, we wanted the blueprints to get the shell of the house done. Because mm -hmm. that's about all we're going to be able to do this year with winter coming on is get the addition, the outside shell, the windows, and the roof on. That's about all we can do. 2400 bucks then, right? Pardon? You were expecting to pay him $2,400. Well, that was minus the, the foundation of our... We, we, we well, were thinking well, somewhere around the 1200 and some well, odd range. Our well, foundation... Well, hold it. Slow down. Slow down. How much was the foundation? Uh, the the bids that we had on the foundation were around $19,000. That much? Yeah. Well, so it had to do with lifting the house up. Well, in the, so then you're only going to spend actually twenty grand. Can you do these additions for twenty thousand? Uh, for twenty thousand, we're going to be pushing it. Yeah. It, but you're the, so you were, you expected to be paying six points of twenty thousand. Right. And what did he say to that? Well, he uh, he said that he felt that he spent excessive time on these drawings and that he had designed a hundred and twenty thousand dollar house and that normally he would get seven thousand and some odd dollars for it. But he would let us have them for the discounted fee of three thousand dollars. Now, this was the first time, Bruce, that he had ever oh, right. mentioned a, but, his fee. Can I ask you the foolish question? Did What's he that? ever reduce any of this stuff before we started working to writing? No, that's see, that that's the thing we just mentioned yesterday. We we said any other any future work we have done on the house is going to be in writing. Well, that's in any business transaction. Yeah. That's wise. Well, we were just you know. This oh, is the first I, I, time we've I, I, ever done this, and we've doing. He's been in business for so long, and if and if that's the way he did business, then well, if, if he designed this hundred and twenty thousand dollar palace, how did he expect you with a forty thousand dollar budget? Well, we see, we sent see. him, we sent him our check for twelve hundred and sixty three dollars or whatever the amount worked out to, stating you know, uh, going back to his original contract of the six percent. Minus the uh, yeah, foundation. but you didn't you didn't answer my question very quickly. How did he expect you to build this? Uh, well, he's claiming that we fraudulently fraudulently told him that uh, understated our budget, and that uh, he says that if we don't pay him the, the remainder of his fee, three thousand dollar fee by next week, that he's going to uh, pursue legal action. Well, he has a right to do that, and you have a right to defend yourself. Don't be don't be uh, intimidated by that. No, we're not. We were just wondering. Should he pursue legal action, what what does that, is that... It means he's going to sue you. I don't know if it'll be small claims or a higher court. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. He's going to sue you, and you're going to go defend yourself and say, we agreed to pay 6% of 40000 less the cost of the concrete work, and that's what we're prepared to pay. Right. That's, the, that, that's it. That was our agreement with Mr. So-and-so. That's your defense. Is that anything... That's, that we're going to need a, a lawyer for well, I don't know that. I don't know what kind of an action he'll take. But that is the sum and substance of your defense. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams for TalkNet. All righty, let's go. Where are we going? I can't even read my own. Oh, yes, WTDY country, Madison, Wisconsin. Hello there.
Hello, Bruce. Hey, how are we doing? Good. Say, Bruce, I may have an answer for your caller from Florida that was looking for the manifold from Texas. Yeah, let's recap for somebody who might not have been with us. He uh, wants to buy something through the mail, essentially. The other guy doesn't trust him, he doesn't trust them. How do you meet in the middle? Okay, our company is negotiating in the early stages with a Russian company right now. And we ran into the same dilemma, though the dollar figures oh, are so much the, higher. The numbers might be a little different, huh? Yeah, a little bit. And it was more or less we had a Mexican standoff saying, I don't trust you, you don't trust me, what are we going to do? And the Russian person piped up and said, well, we do this. And there's an actual name for it, though I can't recall. And anyway, what you do is they would have, and I'm speaking of the Russians, would put the money into a bank here in Madison. And when I prove that I've put onto the boat what they have ordered and take the bills of lading, with, I guess that's what you would refer to, refer to them as, and prove that I did put that product onto the boat, they would then release the money from the bank account, or the banker would do that. And there's an actual term for it. Hmm. And this, you know, this might be too big of a deal for a seven hundred dollar yeah. item. I mean, you're not about a letter of credit of some kind, are you? So I was thinking this guy could call the banker in Texas, open up an account, and say, "Here's the money. If I call you back and give you confirmation that I did indeed receive what I ordered, you yeah. can release the money to this guy. Otherwise, I'll send back what he did send me, and I want my money back." Yeah, I'm not sure a banker, unless you were one heck of a, a good account. We want to get involved in something like that. Right, something so piddly, but in our in our case, it would work out great. Yeah, of course. Well, listen, it's worth a shot, but I think that the, 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 the if you can get a decent credential on the guy, that's about as far as you're really going to go with something of this kind. Yeah, that's true. Hey, thank you for your participation. I appreciate it. Okay, we love your show here. Thank you, guy. I really appreciate that. Clearwater, Florida. Hello there. Hey, Bruce, how are you this evening? I am just fine, thank hey, you. Hey, i got to tell you, I'm so happy since uh, WFLA down here has uh, put you on uh, live at 7 rather than tape delay. Yes, indeed. We're very pleased as well. I, uh, I must admit, I had to, uh, for a while there, I had to work nights in order to listen to you, so now i got to get rid of that night job. And... Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a problem. I just uh, need a little advice from you, if you yeah, don't mind. I'd be delighted. I have a very small video production company down here in Clearwater, and um, uh, what we're doing is basically weddings and, and that type of deal. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to support it, I'm also working uh, another part-time job and another full-time job. I've always taken your advice of, you know, working hard in order to keep things going. And, uh, and uh, so I'm trying to do that. I'm just wondering, though, how to get the word out a little bit more. Uh, early to bed, early to rise. Work like hell. <laughs> yeah. And well, I'm trying to do that. Right? And advertise. That's uh, exactly what uh, I was going to ask of you. What uh, We haven't really distinguished what area we're going to stick in, whether it's going to be weddings or industrial videos. or uh, We also have another uh, concept, which is um, having a, a par an apartment guide on video and then across the nation so anybody can get it out of a local video store. So I have uh, an apartment guide across the nation. Yeah. So if you were in Kansas City, yeah, and uh, you got transferred or wanted to move to Clearwater, Florida, yeah. you would go to your local uh, video rental uh, agency, and they would have in their store an apartment guide on video for Clearwater, Florida. When we say a guide. You don't mean actual rental properties. Uh, yeah, just a, a oh. rental. A rental how, apartment, or uh, how would you how would you update something like that off and up to make it work? Well, it wouldn't be just a house; it would be the uh, regular apartment complexes. You understand? You know, there was, the, I, I, you mean that, that they usually have something for rent, not a specific operation. The Jones Complex uh, on West Humphreys or something, right? With two thousand apartments, you would list them, even right, though right. you didn't know if they had something available or they didn't have something available. That's absolutely correct. I see. And then also, uh, I, that, the 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 cost there would be incredible. Well, it's uh, you figure a forty-five minute uh, video, and yeah. then how many towns are there in this country? Well, I, I can't answer that. Well, that's what I'm trying to get. If you said that you would have one of these in each video store, yeah. How, what, well, in major market areas, we've done well, the even, research. You know, even at that. I mean, we would we certainly we'd go into Atlanta, but probably overlook Augusta. Maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm missing it. I'm sorry. I thought you were, you're going to do every city in the country. 
We'd, we'd like to get every city, but of course we have to start out small. We're starting out with Clearwater and then probably getting into Jacksonville. Yeah, but what I'm trying to get to, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, I think I thought I had, and I did understand. Let's assume that you do a bang-up video for, for the sake of discussion, Clearwater, Tampa, St. Pete. Okay. All right. It's, but you want people from all over the country to be able to rent this thing. That's correct. How many thousands of videos would you have to get out there? and sold to get that done. Well, the ideal thing, of course, is to get behind one major video well, rental. Like a blockbuster or something. Yeah, that's, I didn't want to say that. Well, so, that's fine. I mean, there's only a couple of national... So you say, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, they have to, uh, roughly uh, 2,000 stores. Yeah. So you're supplying uh, probably about 6,000 videos for them to distribute at every one of the, uh, the stores. There. And whatever uh, market area they're in, then it'd be very easy for anybody to pick up I, I maybe I maybe I don't know. I, it just seems to me if it, it's a it's it's kind of like looking the wrong way through a telescope. Mm -hmm. What you're talking about? Okay. Uh, in order for Blockbuster to cover the country and have two in each store, you'd have to have a whole store full of videos. Just, you know, it's if I walked in, I may, I may want to go to Florida, I may want to go to Madison, Wisconsin. Okay, well, the, then the idea is that if you're dealing with a national uh, base for distribution, yeah. say, like a blockbuster, yeah. and they only have 2,000, your market area is only probably uh, two-thirds of that. Because some of these blockbusters uh, are in some areas that uh, yeah, but are you're missing, to deal with. But you're missing something, it seems to me. Okay. But the the idea is for them to rent these things. That's where they make their money. Right. Now, you, in order for them to, to do that in a cost-effective way and to advertise it, they would have to have a video for every population center in the country. Now, if you, let's take radio markets, all right? Okay, let's do there that. There are 250 radio markets in this country. All right. If you had two per market... Just two videos. You make up two for each store. That's 500 times 2,000. You'd have to have a separate building to house the stuff. Yeah, I understand your point. Well, I don't think it would work yeah. for that reason. Yeah. Okay. Now, no. if, if, you, if you said, look, I'm going to do a couple, like I'm going to do Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York, maybe, because enough people go there. Right. But I don't think you're going to do it to places like St. Pete. Yeah. There's just not enough... I, I just uh, do the arithmetic. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Right. No, we we've done it already. Well, it's not. Well, I, mean, I think we've done it. I don't think. I think it, it should be clear to you that it's just it's not cost-effective. Right. Well, I mean, my, my you see, point... if it if it could be done a different way, let's assume that you could produce these things, right? Okay. Then, if there was some way that you could take this off of a computer when you needed it and 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 just conjure it up, right? That might work. Okay, well, that's our next step. That's well, that's the, but, but that's the only way to possibly work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, getting back to my question at hand, which was, what would you suggest since we are a small outfit? Advertise. Right, that's what I'm saying. Which direction would you suggest on that? Our budget is very low. Well, if your budget, you see, you have to, first of all, you have to go out and get some capital. That's one of the things that beats most small businesses. No yeah. money. No money. Hey. Right. I mean, you listen to WFLA, right? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, Blowing our own horn, you've probably heard some commercials for a nightclub opening up in Ybor City. Jelly Rolls, it's called. Absolutely. Okay. We've been advertising for six weeks, and we're not opening the club till next week. Right. And we've spent a ton of money right. to let people know we're coming to town. You have to have that kind of, of capital available to you to get your message out. Advertising does not cost... It pays right, okay. if you generate business. Okay, what I and, and if doing. you don't generate business, it doesn't pay. Right. But you, you, but you just the idea of going buying a couple of spots in the WFLA or buying a, a, a newspaper in the Tampa Tribune, one ad, and it's not going to do it. You've got to be repetitive and get your message out day in, day out. Okay, like I said, since we are a very small business, then what would you suggest? Our, just what I just said. Every day, day borrow, beg. You own your own home. Yes. How much do you believe in this business? 
hundred percent. Were you willing to sell the house to prove it? Absolutely. Well, then do it. Well, it's a, here's another problem. It's not really a house, it's a townhome. <laughs> I know how you feel about townhomes. No, I, have, I, I don't think it's townhomes. <laughs> it's just the values have dropped out. Right, of exactly. So I would lose money if I were leaving now. Well, all right. What I'm trying to get to is I don't. I'm not trying to be quarrelsome. I got to no, let you I, go. Man, I understand. I You've understand. got to get the money somewhere. Right. Otherwise, you're always going to be peanuts. And I can't go to the small business administration. No, sir. You got to go to people who love you. Right. Honest. Yeah, it's too, it's too bad. Uh, <laughs> it's too bad had that dad passed on and mom yeah. broke. <laughs> I hear you. Hi, listen. Uh, <laughs> I suffered from the. But see, but when I was doing this, it was not as quite as difficult as it is today. Yeah. But you've got to be, be advertising works, right. but, it, but it requires repetitiveness. Okay, so I need cash flow, like, majorly from somebody. It would seem so to me. And I would concentrate the things like the weddings and the, and the, and the uh, uh, records of people's homes, so in cases of disaster, they right. can prove it and so That's forth. That's exactly what we've been doing. That's where I would focus. A little bit of industrial work. Thank well, you very the much, industrial Bruce. stuff I put aside, but I do wish you well, Guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Hey, we go to Lubbock, Texas. Hello there. Hello. Hello, Lubbock. By golly, you sound like you're the other side of the world. Uh, we're pretty much on the other side of the world, but happy. <laughs> What's on your mind, guy? Well, I've got a question for you about a, um, a tree in my neighbor's yard. Yeah. It's a fruitless mulberry, and yeah. if you know anything about those, they have great um, surface roots. Mm-hmm. And what has happened is the tree is about 15 foot from my driveway. And over the years, the root has grown underneath my driveway yeah. and has caused it to rise about, oh, four to six inches it's in place. It's absolutely amazing the energy that uh, roots develop to move incredible uh, pressures, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's is you, you, have a, you have an asphalty driveway or poured concrete? Uh, it's poured concrete. Uh-huh. It's and cracking it, probably. Excuse me? Is it cracking? Oh, yes. It's big time cracking. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. And um, I've asked my neighbor about it. The only reason I'm, ask, I'm asking about it now is I've been in this house for six years, mm-hmm. and it's just steadily rising up. Well, what have, what, what have you done to try to, to, to correct this? Well, I asked my neighbor if I could chainsaw through the root. And he says, no, no way. But he's he's the original owner of the house. It's The house is 40-some years old. Well, you don't have to ask him. Um, if the root is on your property, as it enters your property, you don't have to ask him. Just right. Cut it. Now, on the, but, but... And there's a big butt here. You have to do it in such a fashion it doesn't injure his tree. Right. But the I'm changing the insurance companies on my homeowners. Yeah. And my the new agent said that uh, the adjuster came out said said the house is fine and everything, and they're going to insure us. But the driveway, he goes, the driveway is in bad shape. And he goes, it needs to be replaced. And the driveway is in condition that it needs to be replaced. But mm-hmm. I'm just wondering what my, um, how I go about getting my driveway replaced. You, you have to pay for it. It's my responsibility. My, your, absolutely, your responsibility. Okay. But the, but the roots you can cut. Right. But you have to be certain that you do it in such a fashion it doesn't damage this tree, which shouldn't be a big deal because, as you pointed out, these trees put a lot of root down. Right. Well, losing one is not going to hurt them any. No. Well, you've just answered my question then. But be careful with what you might want to do. Uh-huh. Just, to, just to cover yourself. Call a nurseryman and find out if you should be doing something to the root after you cut it. Okay. You know, sealing it in some... I don't know if you should or you shouldn't, but just check with them. Well, I was going to have somebody do it anyway. Okay. Once it's on your property, you have a right to do that, but with the caveat that I described. Okay. Good luck, kid. All right. Let's go to Fayetteville, Arkansas, and say hi. Hello there. How are you doing? I couldn't be better. Um, I had a question about, um, I'm thinking about changing jobs. I'm, you know, 
kind of uncertain, not really skeptical, but just kind of uncertain about the job that I'm looking into. Mm-hmm. And maybe what, let's, let's back up just a, ter- a tad. What do you do now? I'm currently in the investment area as a trader, you know, where my um, income right now is a fixed income, and um, I, I currently just trade fixed income products, bonds in particular, and my salary is just a guaranteed salary on, mm-hmm. on no commission whatsoever. Right. How much are you? Uh, right now it's 27000 All right, and what would you like to do? Um, what I'm looking into, and um, we have been looking into it for, I guess, about a year, is a uh, money management firm in the in, kind of in the area, not too far away. You say a money management firm, does that mean you'd be a financial planner of some kind? Right, right, exactly. And to whom would you offer the service? Um, generally, they offer the services, um, mostly individuals with, say, a net worth of um, anywhere from 100000 to um, maybe a million, kind of in there. They're not, uh, they don't oh. help the... Uh, you know, they're just the average investor, but yet they're not set up for the big company quite yet. They're well, kind of a growing money Take, a, take a deep breath. Yes, sir. How do you find these clients? Do they, do they provide them, or do you have to go out and, and shake the bushes? Um, the way that they said that I would be starting off would be kind of a, a, a joint venture with, say, uh, their top salesman that, that I've come, uh, come to know, and, and then also the president. He said that uh, I've also talked to him once, uh, just for a brief time, and... Um, you know, he said right now he's too busy that, uh, you know, really a lot of the things that they get uh, clients through his seminars and different things of the such, and a lot of the times uh, I would work on projects with him and then kind of spin off and I did whatever clients would respond and I could go on my own that way. All right. Take a deep breath. We'll take a little time out and we'll bite together. Fair enough? Okay. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in. This is Talkman. I am chatting with a young fellow in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He is... Uh, offered a position which which sounds to me like a a financial planner on a fee basis where you'll be selling product. Is that true? Yes, sir. What kind of product? Um, Mostly, I'd say it depends on what type of service you go into. They sell mutual funds and also they do a stock program. That's right. I mean, then they have a a pretty large menu. Right, exactly. Okay, well, you know what you're getting into. Right, I guess, uh, you know, my question is, I'm I'm not, uh, I I need to ask them more questions, really not aware of what all questions, just to make sure, uh, you know, that they're as good as I think they are. I really don't think that they have to be good. Right. You got to be good. Right, to to get in something like that. Well, I mean, it's brought down to its essence. Let's cut through all the baloney, right? Right. They're looking for commissioned salesmen to sell financial products. Right. Well, there's tons of people ready to do that. Exactly. I guess that's what makes me, you know, a little leery to do something like that because I don't like the uh, just the normal broker that has to cold call. And I mean, well, I, if you don't like that, then forget it. Is that right? Well, that's what they're telling you're going to do. Right. They're saying, okay, we run some seminars and we may develop some leads that way. Right? Right, right. But on balance, they're saying to you, look, we're looking for a salesperson. Right. And we're willing to pay. I, mean, I don't know if their commission schedules are as good as, better than, or less than, you know, the competition. You can right. scout around for that. Right. But, I mean, don't cu- don't make this into something. It's not. Right, right. And what it is, is an is offer of a sales position to sell various types of securities. Exactly. Okay. I guess that's, that's it. I mean, I, it, what else is it? Right, right. That's, I guess that does clear it up. And if it, work, if it works, if you're good at that, let's face it, there is a great deal of money to be made. Right. But you got, but you are paid. You can't be overpaid. Right. Or underpaid. Right. I guess that's what my concern was starting out you know, with. Uh, very with you, if any clients. Most salespeople, when you start out, you're going to have to work for little. Right. Till you develop a book or a clientele. That's right. Now that's a matter of fact. And if you're not either financially or, or mentally prepared for that, that's okay, but then don't jump. Okay. But the the, the dough, the real money in this country is made by salespeople. That's right. And that's as it should be because they create, create the activity. Right, right. But you're only paid as good as you are. Right. And you, if you think you're good and that they got good, you know, they have a, an access to, you know, potpourri of products and that's no big deal. Right. That's fine. If not, there are many other houses that can certainly use your services. Okay, thank you, Bruce. I wish you well, my friend. Hey, we've had a little trouble with our telephones, which means we've got open lines available. So if you've had a problem getting through, the number, 800 7438000
888-747-4348000. I would like to hear from you. You guys have been very generous to the program, and I appreciate your kind words. I'm very happy we can share some time together. I'm Bruce Williams. This is Talk Next. About a million years ago, I was stationed in San Antonio, Texas, where our previous caller called from. And and one of the things you find in Texas is that when it rains, I mean it really rains. I mean, they get some cloudbursts. On top of that, at least at that time, there were you didn't because you didn't have the quantity of rain all year round. There were you didn't have the storm drains that you might find in other parts of the country. And there is a a road that was a circumferential circum circumferential road, which has changed names. But I was down there not too long ago, and it's still called Loop 13. If you look for the signs. Anyway, I'm tooling down Loop 13, fat, dumb, and stupid. I'm in the Air Force, you know, just back from overseas. And I'm in downtown and dropped some friends off at the Brooks Air Force Base, which I don't think even exists anymore. And I'm riding that, and bingo, flat tire. Well, those things happen. But now it is raining, and the, there's about six inches of rain out there. Now, you think I'm going to go out there in my brand new Hong Kong cashmere jacket and, and, and British woolen slacks and change a tire? Uh-uh. Off comes the jacket, off come the pants. You know, I'm out there in my shorts changing a tire. And the water is getting deeper. Well... Got the tire changed. Figure what the hell? I may as well go back to. I'm going back to the base anyway, make the Kelly Air Force Base. Why would I want to get my clothes all loused up on this wet body? And who cares? So I'm driving down Loop 13, and we get to an intersection, and it, they have these little dips. So now the intersection, a couple of antennas peeking out. <laughs> I'm not going to drive through there. So I cut through a little field, through a gas station, across the top of the road, into a drive-in. They used to have those things. You remember from American Graffiti drive-ins where the car hops come out. And I'm just getting out of this driving in a hurry. Well, I managed to brush a carload of girls. Hit them. And the, the girls come out of the car like rats deserting a ship because somebody hit their car. And there's this, uh, what kind of people run around in their underwear driving cars and hitting carloads of girls? Talk about embarrassing. I mean, I'm grabbing for my pants, for my jacket. Of course, they're going to turn me into the air police. I mean, they found out I'm in the air force running around in this condition, but I'm still not going to put on that British cashmere jacket. No, that, that's just not going to happen, not in this condition. But that, I understand now they're having the same kind of range down there. In Texas, I was watching the Weather Channel the night before last. I said, boy, I wouldn't want to be there right now. They're having a lot of trouble, a lot of rain. But I got news for you. Keep your pants on, guys. It's very embarrassing to have an accident with a bunch of girls with no clothes on. <laughs> Topeka, Kansas, your turn. How you doing? Bruce, good. Uh, I appreciate listening to your show, uh, and I've certainly learned uh, uh, that uh, I've appreciated your human, your human, uh, very human way of handling these questions. Uh, my question, I think, is simple, and I'll try to keep it simple. Okay. Um, first, it's not pity day. I know that I should have been responsible enough to have adequate um, uh, insurance on my house. Mm-hmm. The question is... What well, we say, adequate. Well, um, we lived in... Um, uh, this happened several years ago. We lived in, a, let's say, an adequate middle-class uh, house. Uh, we had more than adequate belongings in the house. Uh, we had understood that we were insured to the maximum uh, oh, on our belongings. Minute. You own the house, right? We owned the house. Oh, you had a homeowner's policy. That's right. And generally, the 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 uh, insurance on the contents is a percentage of the insurance on the building. That's right. Okay. And uh, never did I dream that we would ever own more. So then, 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 that, then that number was probably twenty percent, something like that. Fifty percent. Fifty. Fifty percent. My goodness. Yeah. Okay. What happened? Well, we had a fire, uh, a very stressing situation for my wife, who was the only one home. Mm-hmm. Uh, smoke damage. Uh, I've learned the value of smoke damage. Uh, we lost a lot. How much? Well, how much insurance? What was the face? How much insurance on the building? Let's start with some place. Uh, One hundred and twelve thousand dollars right, so insurance on the house. On the house. Yes. So that would give you, in this instance, $56,000 with a property insurance, 50%, right? Right. All right. And your your loss exceeded that number? Yes. Mm, how By how much? Oh, probably $30,000. You had 80 odd thousand in inside the house? That's right. That's hard to believe. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, that's you were underinsured, so what happened? Well, once again, I'll accept my responsibilities. Uh, we were underinsured. Right. Um, it's a long story. Well, I'll I mean, it, it, the responsibility of the insurance company would be to pay up the fifty-six grand. That's it. That's right. That's right. Okay. I see, where, where, where so we go with that? The rub is uh, is this, and and this will take more air time than it deserves. Uh, the rub is is that um, in this um, process of trying to um, uh, what appreciate what smoke damage does, we did find out that smoke will damage circuits. Um, sewing machines. Uh, oh, sure, sure. Sewing and machines. A whole uh, bunch of it, almost anything electronic. Stick around. We'll go on the corner. I'm Bruce. This is Talk Day. Bruce Williams on News Radio 550 WSVA. I am chatting with a gentleman in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, he had a, f a fire and smoke loss and was underinsured. He had 50 odd thousand and suffered an $80,000 loss. Your turn. Bruce? Yeah, yes. go for it. Okay, well, generally then, uh, I've admitted I was underinsured, so it's my problem, mm -hmm. and I can accept that. All right. Uh, the situation, the the picture begins to get complicated when uh, we understand that we should first get rid of all the goods that smoke could one day damage. That would include TV sets, uh, VCRs, sewing yeah, machines. The, 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 I think it requires some explanation. It depends upon what was burning that created the smoke i mean some substances when they burn put create a smoke which is far more harmful than others i think we could agree on that yeah well you know that's what we understood okay so this stuff all goes down to a um a local out a local business whose business it is to clean things yeah, up, specialized in it. Yes, I, I, i've ahead. been i've been there go ahead okay well it's fun um my wife is a hobby person, so it uh, to inventory her goods uh, would take forever. Okay, uh, the uh, plot thickens. Uh, the um, the adjuster uh, comes out and talks to us, and uh, he's not too personable, but uh, uh, and we found out he doesn't communicate real well, especially with Betty, who's stressed. Um, Okay, uh, it began to look like I should hire an attorney, an attorney to kind of interpret this, or somewhere. perhaps a professional uh, adjuster. Yes, some somebody. I talked to the agent, who's a friend, uh, and asked him what I should do, and he said, "Well, hold off." Well, we held off and we kept working. My wife uh, put together some fifty or sixty pages, single spaced, of all the things that we had lost. Oh, well, if, if you were. Showing this big a loss next to the in why was there a problem? I mean, did, did they not admit that they had enough, that that you were well over the fifty odd thousand or no? Well, that's where the communication problem entered because the adjuster would simply say to Betty, "Don't turn it in until you have your list complete." So she kept working eight hours a day, twelve hours a day, inventorying uh, material, sewing materials. Oh, so how long did all this take? This took, would you believe, five months? Yeah. Well, I. No, but go ahead. That seems an inordinate amount of time. It, it was. It was. And uh, I don't know. That's the, that's what stress is all about. Anyway, it took that long in about, let's say, month four. The adjuster, I think quite properly so, came to us and said, you know, isn't it time for us to settle this and auction off your stuff mm -hmm. so that we can settle this up? Well, it didn't. I didn't appreciate it at the time, but uh, in my mind that meant, uh, hey, this stuff is um, our insurance company, so to speak, is incurring all this st these storage costs. Yeah, they're, uh, they want to get rid of it. It's they want time to, to settle up. Let's yeah. salvage, yeah. So we're, I hate to be, okay. uh, where are I we know. going with all this? I know. Here's where we're going. Um, after we had, uh, after the, the cleanup agency had, in, had incurred $30,000, and cleanup costs, and, you know, including uh, yeah. okay, they, uh, this, furniture, well, what have you. Right. Then we took our, then you add our own goods on the top of this, and it comes out rem remarkably short. So we, in fact, uh, threw um, these electrical items in the trash. They were sold for peanuts. We could have used them or kept them uh, uh rather than throwing them away. Well, we why did, did you throw we, them away? I don't we, understand. Well, we had not yet arrived at a value. Well, why didn't you, why didn't you store them someplace? 
Uh, you can rent like, a locker for 20 bucks a month somewhere. Like, like I said, uh, you know, stress is stress. Well, you, you only can charge off so much for stress. Really. So where are we going with this? So you, you got rid of this stuff. You made a bad decision. That's right. So we did. You did. We so did. that's the end of that story. Well, Mike, right, we went back to the insurance company and talked about the, uh, the misunderstandings we had. And um, and they left it just about where you've left it, I guess, that that frankly the insurance company had done their job and uh, that the the fact that the adjuster had communicated badly to us uh, well, why badly he seems to me that your that, that your wife was asked to produce something and, and took her a long time to produce it well she was advised to keep at it until she completed well then why didn't she she did it takes five months you could you could inventory rh macy that's, in five months that's right that's right not just one guy's home that's right You'd think so. Well, I would not. Yeah, I would think so. Unless, well, we, we set a record. Yeah, it seems so. Yep. So, uh, I'm at a loss as to what I can do for you. Well, I think that there is no, there is no answer. We did go to the um, consumers agency, um, you know, at the state, and asked them about what their for their opinion, and they said, you know, write it up, and um, and I just thought, well, and I just didn't. I mean, I did write it up, but I didn't submit it because. I think it's one of those things I'm just going to have to eat. I think so too. Yeah, yep. But the uh, the only 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 the guy, the real fall guy in this, should, it seems to me, not fall guy, but the guy to be chastised. You said your insurance agent's a friend of yours. Well, he should have had some knowledge as to what you had in your home, and the fact that you were underinsured ought to at least in some measure be his responsibility. Now, this is years ago, not much you can do about it now, but the fact that he didn't that, that he didn't. Uh, at least recommend that you increase the amount of insurance you have might have made him somewhat certainly morally responsible and perhaps legally responsible but i think you've eaten you've eaten it now let it go i'm bruce williams this is talk that Kansas City, Missouri. hello there welcome to talk that hello bruce hi how are you hi pretty good um... I've got uh... got a question for you i uh... I was uh, I bought a car in October of earlier this year. October uh, of earlier this year. Well, I, I mean, of uh, <laughs> 1991. Yeah, I, I, I didn't think. I, I, I keep think this is 91. Yeah, we missed an October. I mean, where is it happen? How did that happen? Go ahead. Well, I still sign my checks 91. Yeah, that figures too. Go on. Anyway, I, we've all uh, done that. Uh, we discovered that our car is a little small. We uh, had a baby a few months ago, and um, the back seats are a little small, and uh, so we thought. Let's get a van. Uh, we looked through the paper. Well, you bought the car. You, you just bought this car in October? Yeah. And you want to get rid of it already? No, we don't want to get rid of it. I mean, we only have one car between the Well, I'm not. Yeah, what I'm getting at is that, that's, that can, the, the depreciation for the first couple of months is going to be her. It's huge. Yeah. Um, and also a pretty good size. Well, the guy was a good salesman, too. You know. Without regard to that, you're still, it's going to cost you a ton if you try to get rid of that car. Yeah, well, I figured we'd keep uh, uh, one car for the wife to run around and get groceries, and uh, I don't know, maybe uh, our kid will probably be in school in five years or whatever. Anyway, and well, that's custom running around. No, wait a minute, maybe I maybe I missed something. You bought a car in October, right? Well, and you had a, and, and now you need a bigger car. <laughs> Is that, that's what you said, right? Yeah. Well, so what are you going to do with the car you built bought in October? You're going to keep that too? Yeah. Plural. Two, two also. Two cars. Well, we only have one car right now, anyway. All right, so. And you know, I figured it's it wasn't an expensive car. It didn't go. All right, fine. Me. So I have no problem. Are you gonna go out and buy yourself a, a station wagon and become a suburbanite? I did. Right, I exactly. got you covered. I've been down. I played that room. Honest, I know. Um. Anyway, so we uh, we thought that we'd look for a van, but I don't want to buy another brand new car fresh off the showroom. All right. Because I've experienced depreciation, just like you said. Of course. And, um, well, that happens. At least, and with a van, these days are costing twenty thousand dollars. So. Well, you can do better than that in some cases. Well, some yeah, there. You, you uh, certainly can. These days, of these days also, you, know, you get two point nine percent everywhere. And, well, but if with a van without all the bells and whistles can cost considerably less than twenty grand. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I found some for you know in the in the fifteens. Well, it's fifteen is twenty five percent less than twenty according to my math. Right. Um, anyway, so so uh, we we're running through the ads, and I wanted to maybe buy a used van, but maybe a ninety one used. Somebody, I figured in a recession time, there's always going to be somebody who loses their job. Yeah, okay, we'd agree that there's some Has bargains to. out there on the used car. Right. Um, I'm skeptical about you about buying used cars. That's why I don't buy them. Why? Why are you skeptical? 
Uh, you don't know where it's been. Sometimes you uh, you find a car that's, uh, you know, 1990 or something, 1991. You wonder why they're getting rid of it. Well, you look for a logical answer, and there are lease cars for sale. There are, right. uh, there uh, are rental cars for sale. There are people, as you say, that, that, that have lost their job and right. reluctantly allow the car to be prepossessed. There's a lot of reasons. Well, you just try to stay away from... Uh, from Trans Ams and Camaros and things. Well, I, I don't want to start. Hold on, hold, hold it. No, stop picking on brands. Go ahead. Oh well, I'm, well, no. I, I meant um, I meant hot rods. You know, things. muscle cars. Right. Um, anyway, so we tried to find a uh, a car that that somebody is selling because they have to sacrifice it for financial reasons. Well, I understand. You look, you're look, you're right. what's called bottom fishing. Right. So go ahead. So we uh, we came across an ad in the um, in the in the newspaper. And uh, there's a lady who lost her job and got a divorce and everything else and put a big down payment um, on, a, uh, on a 1991 van. And it was like $21,000 when she bought it. Mm. She wants to sell it for, uh, for $13,800. It's a private sale? Right. Go ahead. And uh, so she was looking for somebody to buy the van or just take the payments over. Well, the chances are if you took the payments over... Did you be upside down? Now, I don't know if that's the case or not. But if you take the payments over, the, the, the van would remain in her name, and that is hazardous to your financial health. Well, see, that's what I was going to ask you about. Because well, she, she has been um, uh, encouraging her to, um, I, I shouldn't say brand names, but I, she's been contacting now, don't worry, the but, finance company, yeah. and... They have been encouraging her to put in the paper, do whatever they possibly if they can. can if, if they are willing, meaning the finance company, right. to allow the car to be continued to be financed, assuming everything as you described, I'm, right. I'm not going to go through the whole litany again, and to transfer the title to your name, I have no problem. Right, but see, well, I hold be assuming but, no, no, wait contract. a minute, wait a minute, you're not listening to me. I said, if they are prepared to assign the contract to you, but transfer the title to your name, I have no problem. But all a lot of these deals are set up where the car will remain in the, in the seller's name until it's paid off. I have a lot of trouble with that. What are the hazards to that? What You've got to be kidding me. Suppose she dies. If she dies? Yeah, what if she what? dies? Would there be some kind of a contract that we can draw between us? There's that always they... contracts that can be drawn, but the problem with contracts is when somebody contests them, it costs a ton. To, to, you know, the only lawyers come out a winner on those deals. What happens if she gets into difficulty, financial difficulty, and there's a way to step between you and her? It's just a bad move on your part. You'd be far better off if this is the car of your dreams and it's a bargain the way you've described to go to the finance company and say, are you willing to transfer this car to me and just let me pick up the contract? If they're not, then you go out and look for the best financing, which is not going to be as good as what you got here. Yeah, she um, she bought the car last year, so I'm assuming the, fin the interest rates weren't... Well, they may or may not have been. You can't assume anything. you got to go look. Right. But you're asking what the hazards are. They are legion, and I think you'd be a very foolish guy if you go for that. Wouldn't she be in a worse position to... I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about you. You asked me, should you do it? Is that not true? No, that's true. I'm telling you no. The answer is no, you should not. No, I should not. No, you should not. Well, with all the uh, car sales they're having these days and all the 2.9% financing, I'll uh, probably do better on my own. Well, 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 you're not going to get 2.9 on, on a used car, Tiger. Right, on that's, a brand new That's one. to encourage people to buy a new car. Right. Now, if you're telling me that you can get, you're getting this car for one-third less than it sold for a short time ago, that is, in fact, a bargain. Right. And you might very well be better off to buy that than the new one. On the other side of that, you, if you feel you can swing the new car and with a, with a very favorable financing, okay. But to go for the, this convoluted, uh, I'll take over the payments that stays in your name routine, in my judgment, is a very foolish thing to do. And I wouldn't do it. If one of my kids came to me with that deal, I'd say absolutely no way. I do wish you all well. congratulations on your growing family guy. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. 800-743-8000. Greenfield, Indiana, your turn. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hello there. How uh, are you? I am well, thank you. 
Okay, I'm going to get right to the point. Um, I am in a new job venture that I don't have any experience in whatsoever. What's you up to? Okay, well, basically what it is is with the new American Disabilities Act laws that came into came effect. effect. Yes, yeah, today. Yes. Yeah. So anyway. Well, that's good news and bad news, by the way. Uh, how do you see it as that? Oh, I think there's some gross inequities in that law that have to be reassessed. Well, that, you know, it's going to be a trial and error. Yeah. I mean, they're, 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 it's, this is another law where the intent was certainly clearly desirable. Yeah. But in some cases, the results are clearly in no one's interest, in, 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 including the handicapped. Yes, yeah, that's... We're, we're, we're thinking where facilities are going to have to be built that nobody's ever going to use. Oh, well, now, I don't know. Well, I, I do. I got one that I'm involved with that nobody will... No, I'm serious. You're laughing. No one will ever use. Ever. And what is that? It's an elevator to a stage. Oh, to a stage? Yeah. You don't think that you would have uh, a lot of actors with disabilities? No, this is only for, for... No, there's no actor... No, there's no... It's for musicians. Okay. And a disabled, a, a disabled musician could not, could not perform on this stage. Why not? Because it requires people to jump up and down and leap into the audience and climb up on the pianos and that sort of thing. You're required to be somewhat of an acrobat as uh -huh. well as a musician. It's just an unusual circumstance. I would agree with that. Okay. But it is, is it is very unusual. But that, nonetheless, the law still says you've got to put an elevator in, which I think is that no one's ever going to use. That just seems to me kind of foolish. Don't you agree? Well, in that instance. Yeah, that's what that I'm suggesting. I just think like, yes. no, I'm sure there are other, other well, there's illustrations. Well, going to be, yes, but then, it, it, it needs a shake. It needs a shakeout period. Yeah, but, you know, it, they still have the same rights. I don't disagree. Know. I've never, did, did I, I never said that. The, yeah. the rights didn't exist. But what I'm suggesting is... That the law, like all laws that are written with good intentions, uh -huh. uh, just like zoning laws have good intentions, true. But you got to have a relief valve because nobody can write a perfect law. That's true. The, uh, when I was involved in government years ago, I remember we caught, I remember well, I wasn't involved in this issue, but an office building went up, and it was clear uh -huh. that they didn't require like fifty parking places, but they made them build them, and, and in twenty five years, there's never been more than ten cars in that parking lot. And I, I know a building that I park in, re, you know, has so many because of the ratio of handicap spaces. Uh -huh. I would be willing to bet you anything you can cover. They will never ever be filled two thirds. Well, and there's just the, the ratio is wrong. That's all. Yes. That's what I'm suggesting. And I think I think if we approach it in a logical, sequential, rational, you know, if you can demonstrate that. In, in, the, in the case of the parking, where I have no interest or personal interest, okay? Uh -huh. If there's 50 spaces there, and at the most of any given time, there's only five cars there, then clearly we could adjust that number. I think we could agree on that. Or, if, they, or if all 50 were occupied, then maybe we could adjust it the other way and get some more. Yeah. That's well, all. Yeah, okay. Well, what it is, is I, like I said, I'm new to this, and but it's a very nice job. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I am having a fit about, the uh, my superior and I are yeah. new to this, and we really, we don't know how to go about determining what would be a fair commission for me selling the product. What are you selling? Okay, the auxiliary aids and services what? for the visually and hearing impaired. For example? For example, uh, bus schedules uh, for transportation, you know. But in Braille or in... Yes, in Braille or if, well, most people can really go ahead and make their own audio tapes mm -hmm. and everything. But the Brailling, you know, there's not a lot of, of people that set up with a uh, printer, mm -hmm. Braille printer. But anyway, what we were trying to determine is what a fair commission would be for me selling the product... And then not only that, but I also, they're charged a setup fee besides... Well, here's the thing. We're cutting through this for just a second, okay? Okay. First of all, you've got to figure out what's, how much meat there is in this thing to be whacked up. Uh-huh. Secondly, see, percentages don't mean a whole lot. Okay. If you can go out and cut a million-dollar deal and get 1% and do that once a month, you're making 120 grand a year. True. But on the other side of that, if you're selling something for a dollar and you get 30%, you're only making 30 cents on a deal. Uh -huh. So that the percentages are... are Depending on how, how it's much. It's almost a number you have to... Bat, the percentage has to be backed into rather than gone to frontwards. Okay. I mean, put percentages aside. Now, what I'm trying to get to is how much business can you reasonably expect to do in an eight-hour day or in a 40-hour week? 
or well, any way we want to knock it out. Right. Well, you know, depending on on how much they're really going to need, you know, how many well, schedules. Well, but, but, but that doesn't tell me anything. I'm saying, see, you've only got so many hours to spend at this action, this activity, right? Uh huh. Now I want to know if you got have to, in some way, determine about how much volume you can do. Okay. In that forty hours. Uh huh. Now let's assume for the sake of discussion, it's thousand dollars we'll say yeah all right then we got to figure out, well how much do you think you're worth a week let's assume it's 400 bucks for this again arbitrarily right well then you got to get 40 percent commission it's got to be built into that structure someplace otherwise you can't afford to take the job okay on that and then well okay then like i said we we also charge them a setup fee and since i'm doing the total job going out and selling to the customer yeah, coming right. back in and and uh, doing the setup right. and the printing and well, that buying. doesn't really matter. We're back to the same thing. Back to the how same. much is your time okay. legitimately worth? How much can you earn? Oh. How, and how much can we package it? Yeah, you know, so you get the, you get you get too many fees and all this sort of jazz in there. Without regard to the law, the guy's gonna say I can't afford this, so that there's no, there's no deal. Okay. Do you see what I'm getting to? Yes, I do. So you have to analyze what you, how how you're gonna how much money you're gonna generate. True. How long it takes to generate that money, and then will will the product carry the weight? In some yeah. cases, it will, and some it won't. I That's mean, and this in the, uh, there is there's been a good deal written about uh, the law that you're just, you're describing, and in 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 some cases, it's clear that there will be hardships placed upon business people. Yes, and they are covered by that. That, that will not be able to, to be able to handle it. That's right, and they are covered by that. So. What, do you, what do you mean they're covered by that? Well, if it's going to cause a hardship on them, if it, if they're going to, if they can prove that it's well, going the, to co you know, cause the a hardship. Yeah, but the problem is, how do you prove it, and how much does it cost to prove it? Well, that's another... That's another wrinkle. Yes. I read the act. Uh -huh. Unlike most people, I've read it. That's good. And, uh, and I'm not uh, at, at all disapproving but, yes, I do but, believe, but I do long. believe that there's a, a great many uh, rough edges, let's, let's describe it that way, yes, that, that's that, true. That, that, that will not come to light until such time as they try to, uh, uh, in, well, I guess the word is enforce, because it comes in okay, in stages. Yes. And then you have the other problem that I, I believe that there is some verbiage in there that ho can hold uh, inspectors personally liable if they neglect to have it enforced. And there's a whole bunch of other yeah. stuff in there that... But the point is, it's no different than any other business. Okay. Unle unless, unless what you do can be justified mm -hmm. by the business that you do, you're out before you're in. Okay. And you're going to have to figure that out. How much will a traffic bear? How much can people afford before, if nothing else, they appeal mm -hmm. what you're trying to sell? Okay. So you figure what you're worth an hour and go for it, baby. Well, I'm going to do my best. Uh, <laughs> but you'll knock them dead. Oh, I hope so. I do wish you well. Okay, thank you very much. And I listen to your program all the time, and I've gained some very valuable knowledge, including tonight. Well, thank you a lot. All right. Bye-bye. No, it's not that I'm in no way opposed to the intent of this or many other laws like it, but it's, it's my contention that, and having helped draft a few laws, that uh, there is a definite shakedown period because very well, many very well-intended laws wind up causing a great deal of hardship and damage and heartache. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Harrison. Hello, contact. Today's contact, 12 hours stronger than Betsy's. I've had it with this cold, cold. This is only a drink. <laughs> Alrighty, from Austin, Texas, we go to Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hello there. Hello, I appreciate you taking my call. Oh, I'm delighted you called. I've been listening for some years to you, and we lost you for a while here and had to find you on a different station. Well, son of a gun, we're very happy to be back in Minneapolis. Well, it's kind of nice we get to you in the morning and in the evening, so when I commute, I don't miss out on you. I've got a little bit of a problem, to say the least. Let us talk. I, I'm a small businessman, and I have a piece of property, and a commercial building, and the next piece of property next to me that had a burnt-out house became available. Yeah. And it was owned by a real estate individual, and he was selling on contract for deed. And uh, there was back taxes on this, and there was the city would come out and clean up the property once in a while, and there would be a slap a lien on it for that too. You got it. And but some of these liens didn't sh didn't show up in the taxes. But anyways, I followed your advice and went to to a lawyer and had him drop a purchase agreement. And I said, no, whatever. Stand, slow down now. Okay. You, you were buying this from a private individual, right? And okay. The contract was held by a. 
uh, for the property by a real estate. Yeah. Why? Why? Uh, well, maybe uh, maybe the answer is evident. The the reason it was being done under contract because nobody would give a mortgage on the property in this condition. That's right. It, it was it it had burned out in uh, six months before or something. I see. Okay. And uh, so I went to a lawyer that I knew, and I said, I know there's back taxes, and I know there's uh, some liens against us from the city for coming out and cleaning the property up and cutting the weeds and what have you. And I want to make sure I don't get stuck. So right, do what you have to do. So he. Uh, he made contact with the part with the parties, primarily the one that held the the contract itself. Yeah, you also should have been talking to the city. Well, I gathered he did make some phone calls. The, here's where the the problem was. So he didn't come to the closing, and I really I you know I didn't know that there wasn't a lot of money. It was it cost me uh, thirteen thousand for the property, and I knew there was five thousand dollars going to talk take me to take down the old building. Anyways, what ends up happening is that. Later on, they, uh, these assessments, I get all of a sudden, uh, a year later, I get the city, uh, the county shows up with these assessments, and now again, this year, additional ones. So it's got up to about $5,000. What are these assessments for? Well, literally for coming and, and with a dump truck and picking up the debris from the burned out house before I actually purchased the property. Yeah, but those assessments go with the property, but where was your... Uh, these were sitting in the inspection department of the building. Uh, the building inspection department of the city. Yeah, but they weren't recorded. In they were not recorded. What did your attorney say about all that? Well, we went to the, the city alderman and see if he could do something, but, you know, he doesn't really give me any explanation. Now, what's happened is that to get, there were six parties involved in this because of the closing company and all such. I think there was kind of some favor favors, uh, the title company to the real estate agent and things like this at their closing. Well, that's, but that's speculative. Right. But what ends up happening is that he, to get collected from somebody, he's instigated, you know, initiated some lawsuit. Who is he? My lawyer. And who is he, who is he suing? Uh, the, the people that, the two people that I bought the property from, as well as the title company. Hmm. Now, there was no title insurance bought on this. Why? I have, I followed with the, the lawyer didn't say anything, and I'm so sorry I didn't, I can't tell you. Boy, I'll tell you, I think you got a lousy lawyer. Well, what gets me now is that I'm, I've, he keeps every time he talks to somebody or they write a letter, uh, I get it, I get another bill for you know it's ninety five here and yeah. three hundred dollars there. All of a sudden, I've got twelve hundred dollars in lawyer fees since the original stuff of drawing up the purchase agreement. And it seems to me that you, I have a, I would have an eyeball to eyeball talk with the attorney. I would say the reason I hired you to, to represent me in this matter was to obviate what's happening right now. Exactly. And since. You're not doing what I hired you to do, i.e., keep me out of trouble. I mean, how in the world did you allow me to buy this without title insurance? How in the world did you allow these things to happen? How did you, how did you not determine that there were no liens? Can you show me the correspondence, not telephone calls, show me the correspondence between you and the municipal authorities to determine whether, the, because this this business of the of the city cleaning the place up must have been discussed with somebody, I hope was it. Well, it, it, the thing of it is, is that I went back, I called up these departments. No, no, all later I want, on, forget about it. They sent me out. They sent me out uh, computer printouts. All right, fine. But what I want to know is, did you discuss the fact that the city had done some cleaning here and there with the attorney and prior? Did well, you? Did, well, I knew there was these these no, things. I didn't around. ask you that. I I'm asking a very specific question. Did you discuss with the attorney yes. the fact that the, the municipality had been obliged to come out and clean the joint up? Yes. In that case, he didn't do his job. I think he's got some very heavy responsibility here. Well, I figure that he should be eating some of this. I think he's eating it all. I, uh, I really, but this is the confirmation I needed because this was my next move was I mean, to that's why the it, Board of Ethics if I can't get anywhere with him or whatever. I mean, know? this is, you know, I recommend using attorneys, as you well know. Right. But I also feel that any professional who makes the mistake should be responsible for that mistake. In this case, I think he made several. Well, I'm, I'm in business for myself, and if we blow it, i got to fix it. you got to eat it. No I mean, that's how it is. Absolutely. I wish you well, kid. Thank you much, Bruce. I'm Bruce Williams. I believe in using pros, but I put them on notice. If they don't do their job right, I'm coming right to their throat. This is TalkNet. Waconia, Minnesota. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hi, Bruce. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Good. Screwball numbers, huh? Oh, really? I'm sitting here trying to juggle them. Go ahead. What's on your mind, dear? Well, I have a question for you. 
my husband and I own a house, mm -hmm. and um, the property itself is zoned commercial. Okay. Okay. I own a similar home where the property is commercial, okay. but there was a house on it. Right. Long before there was zoning. Well, right. And originally the house was part of the church, so that's why it was owned commercial. Oh, the okay. church is the yeah. church is commercial. Well, maybe yeah. maybe that's maybe that's an accurate representation. Go ahead. Okay. So anyway, um, what right now we've got um, a rental unit on the house. We have it um, zoned commercial. Wait, wait a minute. You, mm -hmm. you see a rental unit on the house? What does that mean? Part of the house. Half the house we rent out. Okay. Okay. Um, but we have um, homeowners. As far as our property taxes, we file homestead. Yeah. Okay. That's that's proper, I guess. Okay. You, you you live there? Yep. Yep. You, you live, live in half. half. You live in half of it. And the other half is rental. Rental, right. like a okay. sort of like a, a a duplex. Right. Right. Mm hmm Okay. So what we wanted to do is my husband is self-employed, and um, he's in carpet sales and installation. Yeah. And we wanted to open a showroom. Okay. Yeah. And we talked to the city, and they were fine. Um, our problem... What do you mean they were fine? We, we passed all the requirements, all the... You know, we had to have so much off-street parking and... Okay, that, that. you met all of the code requirements. Right. The zoning requirements. Right. Okay. Okay. Our problem is insurance. Um, our homeowner's insurance will not even consider it. No, that's true, because you're commu it's a commercial enterprise. Right. So we need to know, but now, right now, he has um, a, a liability policy for his business right now. Yeah. Um, are, are you going to continue to live there? Mm-hmm. Right. You're going to have a real mixed use then. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're okay. Gonna, but you're going to pay for that. You may have to, you probably could go out and buy a business package that okay. would cover everything. Okay. It's similar to a, a homeowner's policy, only it's a business package policy it gives you liability insurance uh fire insurance burglary insurance the whole routine okay but it's going to cost you multiples of what you're spending now okay because he, he's got because he's self-employed and he subcontracts he's got a liability yeah but that doesn't cover the building okay but see that company won't do anything and our homeowners won't change anything to get us a different kind of insurance to cover it well do you have a captive company no. Do you have a direct writer, or do you have a broker? Did, direct. Did, do you have a direct writer on your, mm -hmm. your homeowners, right? Well, mm -hmm. see, the, many of the direct writer companies do not do commercial insurance. They have very limited policies. Okay. Where, or an independent broker or independent agent can go out and shop the marketplace for you. Okay. And find a company that will write. That's the advantage of an independent agent, that they can, in fact, shop the marketplace and find a company that will, will, will uh, adapt to your needs. Now, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with direct writers. They certainly insure a great many people and very satisfactorily. Right. But in your situation, you probably would be better advised to consider using an independent agent who will then go out, or an actually in this case a broker, okay. who will go out and, sh and, and look at his, on his shelf and see if he can find a company that will work. And if they cannot, then they will go out to the marketplace and find a company that will write the policy. Okay. Because they are available. Okay. Oh, they are. Sure. Okay. Is that going to be an arm and a leg, though? <laughs> well, I, mean, I say said it's going to cost you multiples. Okay. Do you know what I mean by multiples? <laughs> Thousands. Well, no. I mean whatever you're spending now, maybe two or three, four times. Okay. Because it's a you see your your <laughs> there's a different exposure completely right. in a, in a homeowner's policy which covers residential property clearly mm -hmm. and a commercial application. Okay. Okay. And you got to pay for that. Okay. That's understandable. But there, but there are companies who will write it, I'm sure. There are. Okay. Sure. Okay. I do wish you well, dear. Thanks. Oh, um, my. You know, but there is a difference. You know, I, I keep saying direct writers, captives, and so forth. For all those of you who are, I think I'm speaking a foreign language. I mean, there's nobody out in chains being held uh, for ransom. What I'm talking about is a captive agent works for one company. He writes or she writes insurance for the. Uh, well, let's face it. Here, some of the captive companies, captive agents would work for companies such as, but not limited to, State Farm, Allstate, uh, Liberty Mutual. Uh, what's the uh, well? It's, it's those those kinds of companies. Now, they're perfectly fine companies, but 
the agent is only allowed to write insurance for those companies. So if he or she is faced with a problem uh, that their company doesn't write a particular policy or their or the, the risk that came through the door doesn't meet their company's underwriting standards, in many cases they are prohibited, proscribed, from placing the insurance elsewhere, and sometimes they can. Uh, an independent agent ordinarily will represent at least three or perhaps four companies, and they also have a broker's license. Now, a broker then can go out and shop them. And let's assume that they, they look on the shelf and none of their companies will write a particular risk as well, for whatever reason. They then can go out to the marketplace and shop the marketplace and try to place the risk. Uh, for many business people, uh, d because of the, the, the difficulty in, in, in uh, covering some risks, the independent agent or broker is a, is a better choice uh, because they have a much broader spectrum from which to choose. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. TalkNet, 800 743-8000. Middletown, New York. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. How are you? Good. Good. I have a problem. I thought maybe I'd like your input. Uh, in 1988, I purchased a car for my husband. Uh, you, I'm sorry, you purchased a... A car for my husband. For your husband? Yes, because his credit was horrible. He couldn't get a car, or he couldn't get anything on credit. Well, when you, well wait a minute. You did, but you didn't... Or maybe you did. Are you were you agreeing that you were going to pay for this yourself, or was he well, going to kick in? I'm agreeing that I would purchase it in my name, and he would make the payment. Oh well, that's okay. But that isn't what you said. Oh, I'm sorry. No, what you said was I in 1988 I purchased the car for my husband. Uh huh. The implication there would be for... you bought him a present. Isn't that nice? What a great <laughs> wife. Well, he couldn't get anything on credit. Okay, I understand what you're saying. You bought it in your name because they wouldn't trust this sucker. Right. Well, what happened was he I agreed to get this car, and he agreed to p make the payments. Yeah. Well, what happened is in 1989, he asked me for a divorce. Oh, boy. So uh, I went to my lawyer. I explained to her what I did, and she said to me I should go get my car. So I called him up, being nice, and I said to him that you can keep the car if you get it in your name because I don't want it in my name anymore. Well, how is he going to get it in his name Well, when you I know. <laughs> purchased? Well, did, did he? Well, no, he didn't. No, he couldn't. I don't, not until it was paid for. Well... I didn't realize. So anyway, he reneged on the payments, and the bank repossessed the car. Well, wait a minute. Let's, let's slow down. What's your first name? Carolyn. Carolyn, I'm sure you're upset about this. Yes, so, I am. So just calm down. Take it easy, little bit, honey. Okay. Now, what you're saying is that he he uh, didn't make his payments, and so they either he voluntarily returned or turned the automobile over to them or they actually repossessed it they actually repossessed all right now during that period of time were you ever know but the car was still your automobile right were you notified uh yes i was but at the time see i had purchased a car for myself as well in 1980 i'm sorry i'm very nervous about it. i'm sorry i'm sorry i had purchased a car for myself so i had a car for myself in 88 and he had a car yeah but but nonetheless you were notified yes i was that there was a delinquency here Right, I was notified, and I just couldn't possibly pay, make two car payments. Okay, I just thought, but I mean, as long as the bank touched that base, they did yeah. what they were supposed to do. Right, they did. Okay. Well, what happened is they sold the car, they uh, and they only got $1,000 for it because it was in an accident, the car. Oh, how much was owed on it? Uh, $7,000, which yeah. is now on my credit report. 6000 bucks deficiency, of course. Right, so now what it is, I can't purchase a car, toilet paper, anything on really? my... So I don't know what to do because uh, I, I, well, I told my lawyer and she, we went to court and the judge said that he is responsible for the car. But the judge can't change the debt to the, to the loan company or bank. I see. The judge can just make him civilly responsible to you. I see. Well, he hasn't given me anything towards, you know, trying to get my credit straightened well, out. Well, you're not going to get your credit straightened out for a long time. I see. The only thing you can do is put a letter in your file saying that the car was purchased for your then husband mm -hmm. who was not credit worthy the uh, that the divorce settlement uh, directed him to make the payments that he did not make the payments and since you were then divorced you were not in a position to make them now that ain't gonna make anybody very happy but at least it explains what happened I see but I, I think that you were just better make up your mind to the fact that you're not going to see any credit for a while. Well, do you know how long I that would be? 
This will take some years, oh, in all sure. likelihood. Well, my car has 97,000 miles on it now. Mm-hmm. And I need another car, but every place I go, they won't give me... Well, let's start with this. No, wait a minute. Hold on now. Did you, you financed your car, you said? Yes. Did you make your payments on time? Yes, so I, have, I have one more payment, and it's right. paid for. Have you gone to that company? Yes, I have. And they said they wouldn't finance it? Well, when they drew up a credit report on me, they said, well, you're in debt for six, $7,000. And I, I tried to explain to them. I even showed them the letter from the judge. Yeah. And they said, we're sorry, but until this is cleared up, we can't give you any credit. You know, until it's been written off. Right. So then I thought about, you know, trying to pay this loan off myself, but because I'm divorced and I'm raising two children, it's mm-hmm. kind of hard for me. Well, it would be almost impossible. I understand that. So right now, I don't know where to turn. I thought perhaps I could... Well, in some place that could give me a car. Well, there are, pl- there are, you know, uh, let me see, you're in New York. Right. Because I, I, I know I was in Florida yesterday, and uh, there are places in Florida that, uh, these are used cars for the most part, but they finance them themselves. I see. Uh, and they specialize in people like yourself. I see. Because there's a market there. Right. Now, if you look among your used car dealers in your area, mm-hmm. I think the chances are you'll find some that will finance their own rolling stock. Right. Now, they will not charge low interest rates. I will guarantee you that. Mm-hmm. Now, I guess you, I'm desperate for a car. <laughs> hey, do you have a family that could help you? Well, my my mother was upset. Oh, my father passed away. My mother was upset about it. But she said that maybe she thought maybe in a year or so it would be off my credit. No. Absolutely not. No. How old is your mother? She's 74. Oh, boy. Does she have resources? Uh, I don't think so. I don't well, really you know. know. Well, you, I mean, it, would she be in a position to loan you the money for a car? Um, well, I'll tell you the truth. I tried to get people to co-sign. They said the only way I could get a car is for, to co-sign. Yeah. I couldn't get a co-signer. No one seems to be in a position today. Mm-hmm. So... I tried everything I could do. What try. I'm saying is, your mo- does your mother, for example, I mean, you're an audible woman. Mm-hmm. Does your mom have a CD or something someplace earning 3 uh, or 4%? I, be, she'd be better off to have you pay her 10%. Right. I don't believe so. She. I'm just, she, I'm just she, shooting in the dark, that's all. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I've, she's helped me plenty, and I don't think I can go to her. Okay. But Then you might try these automobile dealers who uh-huh. do specialize, for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. in people like yourself that have had a difficulty. I see. I do wish you well, honey. Thank you very much. I do indeed. That's, you know, and the, and the SOB, the husband, who pulls a stunt like this, walks away clean. That's the part that is so distressing. And at the risk of getting my uh, fellow genderists, is that a way of putting it? It's usually the guy that is the, is the louse in this. More often than not, it's the guy that walks away. The woman meets her obligations honorably. Someone to count on, a friend you can turn to, someone to share with, because that's what friends do. Someone to listen, talk it, someone who cares. Well, hello there. How are you? I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. Welcome to TalkNet. We talk to you about you, the things that are close to you. Hey, get yourself a little bit of a jam. Maybe I can help you out. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm so pleased you're here. I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome to TalkNet. From time to time, it's incumbent upon me to remember and to mention how many nice people around the country make this whole thing happen. There are literally hundreds of engineers on our stations, and of course the station folks and the salespeople. The guys and gals around here in the radio operations desk, Sheila behind the glass, Stacy behind the glass, Bill Lally in his office making things happen, Nancy Murray, the guys in Washington that we need, uh, guys in California. It is truly a, a, a pretty good size operation. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, the, I get the spotlight and I'm delighted about that. But without those folks laboring the pits, the whole thing couldn't happen. So. I do thank them. My number is 800 743 Anywhere in North America, we go to Millington, Tennessee to kick off. Hello there. Uh, hi, Bruce. Hi. Uh, I got a question about um, mail order catalog type things. What are we buying? Well, uh, I bought a bedspread through a, the catalog. A bedspread. Well, yeah. that seems reasonable. No, it's not too bad. And uh, the problem I'm having is that... Uh, 
Oh, boy. How do I say this? I the reason know. I bought it, my wife liked it, of course. Well, that's, that's one good reason. That's a good reason. If your wife likes it, I think you're off to a great start. Yeah. Uh, but the, com there is no, the company doesn't have any offices or anything in the state, and I've always been under the impression, I can't remember where I heard it, but that they could not charge a sales tax. But it, first of all, companies don't charge sales tax. States charge sales tax. That's right. Companies collect sales tax. Okay. And if, you're, if your state enters into a reciprocity agreement with the other state, which is being done more and more. They got to collect it. Mm. And there is, you know, there's been a great deal of pressure. You realize that on the oh, federal sure. government yeah. that uh, that they should collect for everybody because the real, the local merchant says that that the and it's true that the mail order house has an enormous advantage <laughs> if they don't have to collect sales tax. Mm -hmm. Right. Is the, is the okay. state adjacent to yours? Uh, no. Oh, the reason I asked that question uh, in many situations where. Uh, states that are adjacent to each other, they get together. Right. Yeah, I can say, see where that would happen. Sure. But uh, sure. no, this is uh, up up east, and uh, yeah, have, it's a major company, but um, they just don't have any stores in this area. Well, it may well it may well be they've entered into an agreement with your state. Okay. Uh, could I check? Not volunteer. Not sure. Well, I tell you one thing: if you call your state your state's sales tax department, they're going to tell you, you bet your life. Of you're course. Pay. Yeah. Uh, you know, they even you know, it, it, uh, back in my salad days when I was doing interviewing and that kind of stuff. I got one of the the uh, head of a sales, you know, the depart sales state sales tax departments on the air, right? Right. And uh, this this is a state that's kind of segued in between. Let me see, it'd be one. I'm looking. At, I'm looking at the borders now, right? One, two, three adjacent states that I can think of. I probably missed one. And they said, "Oh yes, our citizens are required required." When they buy something out of state, to fill out a form and send us the tax. Oh, yeah. I, and I said, gee, I'll bet you really had to have a reprinting on a second and third printing on those forms. He left. I mean, who's going to do that? I never have. Cause well, I, I'm in the military, and I've done that. You know, I've had that every year They, you know, on the tax forms. It says, uh, have you bought anything out of state? Well, I'll say, everything I bought is out of state. Well, the the point is that, you know, you buy a bottle of scotch in one state, bring it to the borderline or a television uh, and and there, there's a disparity, too, in taxes from time to time. Uh, thinking about two states that I am quite familiar with, the sales tax is, in one state, selective. You know, it's not across the board. Oh. For example, clothing is not taxed. Hmm. And uh, clothing... Pardon me? I haven't heard of that one. A selective tax? Oh, what I've, I've heard of selective, but mainly on groceries. I didn't... No, clothing is not taxed hmm. in, in one state, and it is taxed in another. Well, at the other t state has an 8% sales tax. So you go out and do your Christmas shopping and spend a thousand dollars on clothes. That's eighty bucks. Yeah, and that's certainly worth driving across the border for. Mm -hmm. And it used to be if you had it sent, you know, UPS or something, you didn't pay the tax. Now you got to pay the tax on taxable well, things. And even on uh, hard items, in one there's a there's a one point spread. It's seven percent in one state, eight percent in another. Hmm. I mean, there's a whole. It's just it's kind of unusual because I have been doing a lot of mail order recently, uh -huh. uh, and this is the first time I've had the sales tax. Not through this company, but through various companies. And Indeed. Well, all you'll... of them have not charged me sales tax. Well, again, you're using the wrong term. Not. Mm -hmm. right. There's, no, there is a difference, really. The merchant doesn't charge tax. Right. He is required to collect tax at his expense, by the way. Hmm. And then, then forward it to the state. That's right. For example, I own some stores, and we have to collect sales tax. Right. At our expense, we got to keep separate books, fill out forms, and whatever. It costs us money. Hmm. You think I'm happy about the sales ah, tax? No, not really. As from a merchant's point of view, hmm. uh, I am not. I mean, if they gave you 1% for your trouble, you might break even, mm -hmm. but they don't do that. Right. I mean, it's just another expense in doing business. You have to do... It's similar. Uh, as an employer, you've got to take money out of your employee's pay. Right. Right. Well, that requires bookkeeping, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Federal government doesn't pay us for that. Mm -hmm. we're, the, we're the involuntary employee of the federal government. When you th Think of it in that context. Oh, yeah. That's true. Yeah, they're getting something for nothing, basically. Indeed. But you can write to the company and ask them under what rule or regulation they're collecting the sales tax. Well, what they have to say. They're just saying it's their policy. And well, it may be their policy. Yeah. They collect it from every state. Yeah. And then send it on because they may want to do business in those states and not looking for grief. I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. I don't believe I, I don't believe that uh, you can prevent them from doing it. You can stop doing business with them. Yeah, that's and find a company that has similar products and. There you go. Yeah. And, but I think what's going to happen sooner or later is you're going to see uniformity.
Probably. That yeah. uh, you'll have to collect them. Can you imagine for a company like, say, Sears that does business in all 50 states, the massive amount of bookkeeping that would be there? Oh, boy. It'd be incredible. Oh. And, you know, and you know who's going to pay for that? Oh, uh, yeah, we are. Certainly. The, we're, the, the, the customer ultimately pays for everything as it mm -hmm. must be. Oh. I do wish you all. I'm Bruce Williams. Stick around. This is TalkNet. We go down to Columbia, South Carolina, see what's cooking. How you doing? Pretty good. How you doing? Just fine, thank you. Uh, hi, questions. I've got a five-horsepower riding lawnmower that I bought uh, way back in about 75 mm -hmm. for uh, like $200. I've got my money out of it. No. No, no complaints there. I don't think you have a whole lot to complain about. But no. uh, in any case, uh, it's a basic strip-down model, you know, one-speed kind of thing. But, That's the uh, best kind to have. There's less to go wrong with them. With a half acre lot, you don't need anything more than that. Indeed. Well, I think we ought to get you a push mower, kind of build up your legs. <laughs> I'm too old for that. Anyway, uh, it's getting uh, been getting harder and harder to start and all that kind of stuff. So I called a local um, lawnmower, small engine repair here, and said, "Hey, uh, you know, can you do something like rebuild this engine?" And they said, "Sure, be glad to." Took it into them, paid them almost 120 dollars. How much? 118 dollars. Okay, 120 bucks. Go ahead. Uh, to rebuild the engine. Yeah. I uh, got it back, uh, started, didn't work well, took it back to them, and I've been uh, round and round with them, um, and they basically say, well, you know, they rebuilt the engine, and um, so they've done what they uh, were paid to do and can't do any more. Now, if it were a case where, like, I had the engine rebuilt and then the transmission went out, I'd agree with them. But basically, in brief, what it does, after about uh, 15, 20 minutes of running, the engine seems to get hot, and it gets running worse and worse to the point it won't even start. Well, it would appear that the, the rebuilding was not done properly. Well, that's what I'm saying. They say one thing they can do, they point out it's an old war and all that kind but, of stuff. But, but they knew that when, they, that's when they undertook the task. I agree with you. That's true. And so my argument is that, well, I paid just money. I expected the engine to run when I get it, to be able to cut my grass, and they said no. Said, they said no, you can't expect that? That's basically what he says. He can't do any more other than put a short block on it at my expense. That's all he can do. And I said, well, you know, whatever you have to do. And, in fact, I ended up um, sending him a letter, giving him three options. One is they can give me my money back. Uh, the other one is um, we can um, – well, I gave him an option where he could, I'll take it back to him one more time and he attempt to fix it. He delivers it to me so he can see that I haven't, you know, tinkered with or anything like that. And – uh, if it's still done cut, then give me my money back, or I'm being very brief in these. Uh, we can uh, agree to have somebody else repair it at their expense. How about agreeing to sell them the lawnmower? Well, I could do that. I don't know. I haven't even uh, approached them at doing uh, mm -hmm. at that possibility. That might... You see, the problem is you're going in, you're going to war here with nothing in your cannon. Mm -hmm. Let's take the worst case scenario. Says the heck with you. What do you do now? Well, of course. Uh, I thought about maybe getting an attorney involved. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. See, you say hello to the, I'm talking about. You say hello to the attorney. There goes the 120 bucks. Yeah. That's that's for the handshake in the outer office. And I thought about small claims, but I've I went to small claims on another matter, and I found that <laughs> down here small claims doesn't uh, doesn't work too well. Well, I don't know that you can draw a conclusion like that from one experience. Well, you might have been wrong. Yeah. No. Well, in that case, I got uh, in the other in the, this other case, uh, I got the uh, uh, judgment, but it's not collectible. Well, that's seventy percent. Yeah. Seventy percent of the judgments that are granted are not collectible. Mm. Okay. So that that doesn't well, set you. I'm a little bit uh, cold feet on going that. Well, wait a while. It doesn't mean it's not collectible from him. He's in business and he has, probably has some money. Oh yeah. Really? Well, in that case, it might be collectible. So you think that might be... Uh, well, if that's what you want to do. For 120 bucks, would I do it? Probably not. Mm. I think after 16 years, I might be inclined to think, Jits, maybe it's time for a new lawnmower. Well, that's why, if, you know, if he'd give me my $118 back, that's probably what I'd do is go ahead and get a <laughs> lawnmower. Yeah, but you had that option before. Yeah. If, if I had known it wasn't going to be... Does, does he sell used lawnmowers and stuff? Um, yeah, he does. Why don't you talk to him about buying your lawnmower? Okay. The, the way it was working before, it wasn't worth anything, right? Well, or, so, well it was worth next to nothing. I, I yeah. bet I, I junked one here a couple of months ago, but it was in better shape than the one you had rebuilt. And probably the same vintage, by the way. Mm -hmm. The point is that, you say, look, I'll tell you what, you give my money back, I'll give you the doggone piece. You can do what you want with it, and you can sell it. Maybe you can make a little money. I'm going to go out and buy a new one. Or maybe if he sells, does he sell new lawnmowers? 
Yeah, he does. Well, maybe you can work a trade out. You know, how, what, what, what are you going to give me on a trade in to make us both happy? Yeah, that's about too. And you're out there sporting a new lawnmower. Mm -hmm. I do wish you well, guy. All right. Thank you. If, for, for dollar values of this kind, negotiation clearly, clearly beats litigation. Or so it seems to me, Bruce Williams, and you betcha, this is TalkNet. Well, hello there, how are you? I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to TalkNet. It's a party line. And you're a big part of that party line. Now you can do it passively, just eavesdrop, or you can really take the bull by the horns and give me a shout. Either way, I'm so delighted you're here. Welcome. Welcome to TalkNet. Our telephone number is 800 743 That's good from anywhere on the continent. I hope one of these first days you're my guest on TalkNet, as you are in Queens, New York. You're number one. Hello there. Uh, yes, I received an application to obtain a uh, a card, which will offer me 50% discounts on hotels. Mm -hmm. uh, one other legitimacy, it costs $50 a year, which isn't too heavy. There are a lot of uh, discount organizations for hotels, and you can save if you travel very much mm -hmm. geometrically. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean you can't negotiate a lot of deals yourself, because you can. Yeah. In the hotel bed, one of the major hotel executives in the nation representing one of the biggest chains in the nation said, anybody who pays the rate that we ask at first is a fool. I see. Yeah. Well, you can walk in and negotiate. Okay. But there also are a couple of uh, organizations, one that caters, it's a small one, that, that pretty much uh, devotes itself to casinos, mm. and another which uh, is a little broader. In fact, it's a lot broader. Yeah. Uh, and in both cases, they are legitimate. Yeah. And you can, if you if you stay in hotels very regularly... Uh, well, you know, if you don't stay in regularly, I mean, it says 50% off the first night, so you're getting your money back. Well, understand, that that's not every mm -hmm. hotel every night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You understand that? Pardon me? You understand, it's not every hotel every night. Oh, yes, I understand. For yeah, example, you get the right hotel. You're, you're in New York City, right? Yeah. Okay. You can bet your life and firstborn child that those deals will not be around when the Democratic Convention comes uh, to New oh, York. Oh, I understand that. I mean, part. It's just not going to happen. No, 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 I understand that. But, yeah. but you can, but the, it's certainly worth. Uh, it, 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 it just you can save a ton of money. Yeah, so it's worth worth, worth fifty bucks for for a shot. Huh? I would think so. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay, Appreciate kid. Bye bye. Oh yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of discounts available, but understand this. Uh, the hotel industry in this nation is overbuilt and will remain overbuilt for some period of time. Uh, this doesn't apply to the, the, the low-end motels. You're not going to do much negotiating with them because they haven't got any room to negotiate. But the higher-priced hotels, it is amazing what you get if you ask. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. Reno, Nevada. Hello there. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. Well, that's good. <laughs> my name, uh, she said no names or dates, but that doesn't mean my name, does it? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. What's your name, dear? My name's Joey. What's on your mind, Joey? Um, uh, we bought a house here in Reno. Bear with me. I'm a little nervous. Um, we bought a house here in Reno in October of last year. Um, the builder took a dislike to my husband and I almost immediately. Well, what did you do to him to make it a dis... What were well, you... originally when they put up the drywall in the house, I was here all the time watching them build it and everything. And when they put up the drywall, I started noticing that the walls looked... Um, shorter and different than the model that I looked at. Uh -huh. So I went into the model and measured the walls and I measured the closets, etc. And two of the closets were 24 inch less deep than the ones in the model. 24 inch? That's two feet. Yes. That is a significant... Where would the two feet go? And Seriously, if they, if they put the, draw, the back of the closet up, what's behind that? Where would those two feet go? One of them is in the stairwell. They didn't. That's a great place for it, and that's where you need extra space. Yeah, and the other one was in the upstairs closet, and I don't know where the space went. <laughs> what, what's behind that wall? Um, the outside wall. Well, it must be uh, the two foot gap in there someplace. I can't believe the outside wall is different. Well, or is it? It it, I, it is. Huh. See, the outside wall is different, and then see, and then in the bedroom, in the master bedroom, which adjoins the bathroom that's next to the closet. Yeah. Um. The space between the two, between the two windows that are on the outside wall, was four inches less. No, oh, all right. So you have significant differences between the yes. model that was that, that was that was used to induce you to enter a contract That's and what correct. you're getting. Now, are you 
when I, I, here we go again. I hope I get the right answer. Were you represented by counsel at the beginning of this transaction? Uh, no. No. Why? Uh, Can I ask you why? Um, my husband, we used a girlfriend that is a, a, a lawyer, but just as advice, but we didn't, you know. Um, uh, why? I don't know. We didn't think of it. Oh <laughs> I didn't listen to you often enough. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. See, how much, but, how much are you paying for that? I'm, I'm making a point maybe for someone else who's listening to this uh, nonsense. How much are you paying for this house? One hundred and thirty-eight thousand. One hundred and thirty-eight grand. Well, that, that really isn't. That's the kind of money you go down to the casino and play with on weekends, right? Right. <laughs> given a, given the magnitude of the transaction, mm -hmm. to spend uh, four or five hundred dollars as, for lack of a better way of putting in an insurance policy, yes, just seems to me prudent. Well, um, I worked it out with the with the um, builder. I talked to him about How do you work out the, well, I, a, a window that's in the wrong place? Tell me. Well, the window wasn't really in the wrong place. It was just less space in between the two windows. Well, then it was in the wrong place. Well, all right. You're right. <laughs> but, but see, the wall was just shorter. How, do, then, you, how do you work that out? Well, what I did was is I told him it, it didn't matter that much to me. Well, the, I would never have told him that. Well, no, I didn't tell him that. I, it just personally didn't matter that much to me, except for I told him that it did. And as compensation for them not having to tear down a support wall, you know, the whole outside of the house, yeah. um, they, we worked out a deal where he completely landscaped my backyard, put in a sprinkler system. Okay, so you got a quid pro quo. So far, yeah. we're okay. Okay, so, but in addition to that, that's, that's what made him angry to start with with me, I think. <laughs> he didn't like the fact that he had to give up something. The agent told me I would get $150 free planting certificate from a, a local nursery uh, when I cl did the closing on the house. Never did come, never did come, never did come, and I asked about it three or four times. And when I went back to the builder personally and asked him about it, he said, I've done enough for you. And I said, well, that's in addition to the... Okay, so um, where are we going with this? You, you, well, so far, uh, you sound like a pretty good negotiator to me. Okay, so um, he just flat refused to give me the $150 planting certificate that he gave to everybody else in the project of about uh, 200 houses. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to know if there was any recourse on that, but my... Well, you guess that if, if that was promised to you and you can demonstrate what you said, you could make his life miserable and take him to small claims court. I didn't know if I could take the small claims court for for a, what was considered a gift. Well, but it was it was an inducement to buy. If they gave it to everybody else, that's not a gift. Okay. It's an inducement to enter into a contract, and that would be it's as I view it. Okay. Now the reason I gave you all that story was that's to tell you why he doesn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> so where? <laughs> so what else going, is he? What? Okay. The, when we did the final walkthrough, there was a big nick taken out of the linoleum in the kitchen. And we pointed it out to them. They said they would repair it or they would, you know, replace it, the linoleum. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, fine. Well, it, they said they would, they would, they would. We did the closing on the house. They kept promising and promising. And then finally they came and they repaired it. And two months after they repaired it, it came up again. The nick came up again. It was like a little flap that they glued Understand. down. Understand. Okay. Um, so I said that that's not acceptable. I wanted the that section of the linoleum replaced. Right. Well, they sent the people out, the, uh, the floor people out, and they said that let linoleum was discontinued. So they couldn't replace it because they couldn't get the same lot number. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, then you're going to have to replace the entire floor. Well, they said they didn't want to do that, that they turn it over to the contractor's board. So we turn it over to the contractor's board. The contractor came, uh, board gentleman came, looked at it, evaluated it, da 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 saw it on the walkthrough, said since it's on the walkthrough, they have to replace it. So mm -hmm. they right, have I have to, to ask you to it. kind of capsulize. So where are we okay. now? Well, we're at a point where he refuses to let me upgrade the floor because um, he says he doesn't he doesn't want to. He's only under legal obligation to replace what is there. That's probably true. Well, I wondered if I have any recourse when the people straight across the street, their floor came up. No. They let them upgrade it. They, that, but they did it gratuitously. One person, they want to do that, fine. I don't think you have any recourse in that. You have to go with what they give you. I can't pay an additional I no, mean, I, I mean, no money I, out of their pocket. I think you're absolutely right, but he's doing this to hurt you. Uh-huh. And I, th I don't think there's much you can do about that. 
Okay, that's all I wanted to know. I think you stuck with that one, but I think you did a good job at sticking it to him, too. Okay, thank I do you wish very you much. well. I'm Bruce Williams. Hang in, kids, for TalkNet. We go now to the Big Apple, otherwise known as New York, New York. Hello there. Hello. Hi. Yes. Hi, Bruce. My wife and I love your program. Well, thank you. Uh, we're in a bit of a quandary over whether or not to purchase an apartment, which is in the building that we currently reside. It's a condominium building. <laughs> the uh, asking price on the apartment is $835,000. How much are you renting it for? No, no, no. We are, we're living in the same building in a different apartment. Well, a comparable apartment? There's nothing comparable. It's the penthouse apartment in this building. Well, uh, give, then, then I'm, what I'm trying to establish is some parity here. If the, the apartment yeah. that you're in now... How, I'm, hold on now. Sure. How much would that sell for? Approximately three hundred and forty thousand. All right, three and a half hundred thousand. Right. So that's boy, you give me a you give me a headache here. <laughs> that's about forty percent or thereabouts right. of the value of the one you're looking at. That's correct. How much are you paying in rent for this one? Well, we own it, and well, all right. it's approximately the mortgage on it is about. Well, no, wait, hold it. If, yeah. if you own it, it's worth three and a half hundred thousand. Right. It's you, it, let's figure ten percent money for the sake of discussion. Fair enough? Sure. So that would be uh, 10, 20, 30, two and a half thousand dollars a year. And how much is the maintenance? Maintenance about 700 a month. All right, so that's another 4,900 a year. No, no, what am I talking about? Uh, no, no, seven, no. Seven, uh, 8,900 a year, 9,000 a year. Right, yeah. So we're at 41,000 to live there right now, mm -hmm. plus the usual utilities, all right? Sure. And if we can take the 40% number, that works out real nice. Okay. Be a hundred thousand to live in the other place. Right. right. Now, what would, what, it would, what would it cost you to live in the other place? Well, eighty thousand dollars for interest. What's the maintenance cost? Uh, the maintenance is approximately fourteen hundred a month. But well, my question so is not. Is well, not we're, 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 then you've established the parity. I just want to establish yeah, okay. parity. I understand. It's about the same cost in terms of relative values. Right. Okay. That's go. That's correct. That's correct. Um, the the. The quandary that we're having is over the following uh, situation. This is a tax abatement building. There are approximately six years... Let's explain to what the rest of the world okay. what that means. As much as I understand this it, This is a screwball arrangement yeah. that New York City has the unique distinction of, of creating, and uh, the whole housing picture in New York is different. The rest of the world is saying New York is crazy. Right. Would you agree to that? Yeah. Oh, okay. absolutely. Okay, so You're there's... First to agree. Explain what the abatement program okay. is. As, as much as I as much as I am able to explain it and understand it, approximately in the mid to mid '80s or so, in order to incent uh, to stimulate developers to want to build, they gave developers a uh, an abatement on real estate taxes. In this in the case of this particular building, it was a 13-year abatement, so that we do not currently pay real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. We will begin to. They, the real estate taxes will begin to phase in in about five or six years. And how big a phase? Okay, that's the that's the big that's <laughs> the gonna, bite. It's going to be a big one. I'm oh yeah, in this penthouse building, in the current in the place we are currently, the the number is going to be about six thousand dollars a year, which is very manageable. You know, no problem. Mm -hmm. In the penthouse, and I had never heard of numbers like this in my life. Um, <laughs> the the real estate taxes, if you can believe it, are going to be about twenty grand a year. I can believe that. Right. Okay. I couldn't. I just don't have as much experience as you do. But no, I'm just on an eight hundred thousand dollar building. Yeah. I mean, or, or an eight hundred thousand dollar unit. Not a unit. Yeah, right. I can understand that. Okay. So now, now, you, now we we've now goosed the cost of living in this place right. to one hundred and twenty grand. Right. 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 What do you? How much do you earn a year? Well, between my wife and I, approximately in the neighborhood of about four hundred thousand. In, in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, but, you're, you're 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 pressing. Right, right. But the so so here's let me let me just let me just bring it home and just ex just tell you the, exactly the reason why I was asking your guidance on mm -hmm. this. To the best of our knowledge, this place has been on the market for about two years. At what price? He started at one point two million, which was completely out of whack. He moved it down now to eight thirty five. Mm -hmm. He, uh, as far as we know, in the last three months, has got not even an offer. The place is still for sale. So it's overpriced. It's it's overpriced, and plus we think that when people uh, come to the realization that they're looking at twenty thousand dollars a year in real estate taxes, everybody just turns around and leaves. We were hoping to possibly put an offer in that would reflect the fact 
that the real estate taxes are, are out of whack. Perhaps not out of whack, but are extremely high. At least it seems a lot of people think they're out of whack. Indeed. He's also turned a four-bedroom apartment into a two-bedroom, which huh. we, we think hurts the value of the place. Well, that can be reconverted back right. for, exactly. for a relative. When you start right. talking these numbers, a modest number. Right. That's not a big problem. It's just that, you know, in terms of selling it, 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 it selling it, to us or to anybody else, Indeed. it seems as though he's hurt the value. I would not disagree. Right. So there's a, there's a soft market out there. I'm sure you would probably soft. Agree with that. If it ever improves, <laughs> it is soft. Right. What we are trying to accomplish is to perhaps buy the place and be able to sell it in six or seven years and at least get our money out. I think there's a poss very distinct possibility in six or seven years there'll be a profit. But I mean, he's asking eight thirty-five, right? He's asking eight thirty-five. Well, I'm thinking of offering like something like some ridiculous low figure, like six hundred. Oh, well, I'll offer him six then. All you can say is no. Right, right, right. And you have room to maneuver upwards. Mm -hmm. And depending on how motivated he is, mm -hmm. uh, you have nothing to lose. Uh, you, the, you were, in my opinion, that you guys are making a ton of money, mm -hmm. but you're also spending a ton of money on housing. Right. You'd be at, at, at eight hundred grand. You'd be right in my my judgment. Double your income and those numbers taking taxes into account. You're right at the end of your strength. But it sounds like a gracious way to live. I do wish you well. I'm Bruce Williams for Top Man. Seattle, Washington. Thank you for your patience. What's on your mind? Oh, great! It's an honor. Uh, excuse me. I'm I'm very nervous. So I'll I'll. Uh, Try to get this. Oh, well, I'm glad you're here, kid. What's happening? Okay. Um, the uh, Seattle Department of Administrative Services is planning to relocate a communications tower. Uh, we live adjacent to a water, a water reservoir, two reservoir towers, and between them there is a communication tower. Oh, my goodness. Right. And it's been, I've lived here 21 years. It's been in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Now they want to relocate it right across the alley uh, from my house. Mm, why? Okay, they say there's a blind spot because of the towers, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a little bit lower elevation, and they uh, would get a better coverage. Mm -hmm. This is uh, for police and radio. Yep. And so um, they are. They're also going to build a little uh, equipment shed. Yeah, a little transmitter shed of some kind. With an above grade propane fuel tank on the site. Well, that I don't find a problem with. You don't think so? No. Okay. I had propane fuel for years, and I, don't, I never was the least bit nervous about it. Okay. Now the other thing is, this alley is a it's kind of a getaway. Uh, what does that mean? Route for uh, police chases. Oh, how nice! And uh, you know, we, we're always you know there are we see cars sitting out there. Who knows why? And uh, because there's two garages, and they can kind of hide behind that, and they'll have a gate there to, to enter this spot. But the, my 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 point is, I want to know what kind of comment. I mean, I want to I want to we're, we're fighting this move. Well, I'm not sure you're going to fight it successfully. Really? What they're saying is that the public good will be served right. by having a better communication system, and there may be a couple of people whose lives will be interrupted, but there may be many more that will receive better police service and maybe life and death service. All because right. the communication system is better. I don't think there's much you're going to do about that. Okay, then the other comment I have well, is... Let me, let me ask you a question before we uh -huh. proceed. Is the, let, let's assume, you don't want it there. Let's start with that premise. Right. Can you make a suggestion as to where I could go and do the same thing with less effect on the neighbors? Okay, so now we have, they, they called a meeting for all the, the nearby residents. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking uh, as I walk around the, the site. There is on the opposite side of the reservoir... Uh, it has a you know, reservoir basin, uh, another site, but it's on a busy street, and it would be more visible to the public. Well, forget about the visibility. Electronically, would it be as viable there? Yes, it would. How do you know that? Because it's the same distance away from the towers. That doesn't tell us anything. So it seems you'd, have to have, you'd have to have an engineer. Right. Who would but, well, that was our suggestion, that they at least look into it. See, I, my feeling is they're trying to hide it behind, it, behind on this alley. Mm-hmm. Make, um, it le make it less unsightly, but it's very public, unsightly right. for you. Right. Except for us. For us, this tower is going to be, uh, let's see how tall it's going to be. It's going to be a 140-foot tower. Mm -hmm. And they're saying that uh, because the elevation is lower, it won't seem so high. But to us, it's going to seem just as high because we're of course. at the same elevation. You're looking right at it. Right, exactly. i got a feeling this is one you're going to lose. Okay, now my other question is, 
what about you now we're thinking of selling our house i mean i don't want to live next to this mm-hmm. uh in a couple of years but uh what can i put points can i bring up for being compensated for this it's obviously going to lower the value of our house hmm. that's a legal question yeah and i don't know the answer to that whether or the night you can get any compensation if the you see the the ordinarily a community is exempt from its own zoning Right. So they can do what they want to do. I see. And if they happen to stick something next door to my house I don't like, I'm stuck with it. I mean, the, the, you know, the, the, the thing that, the specter that would really bother me is a huge water tower. Well, they're upgrading them to make them earthquake-proof. That's I don't, I'm not worried about earthquake, maybe just in terms of the looks of these, these huge water towers. And they, you know, they stick them up and they got you got to have them in order to I have know. water pressure. But the point is... Uh, a radio tower, I think I could probably live with, but, a, but these massive water towers would scare the bejeebers out of me just in terms of, of what it would do to uh, property value. Except that, see, they were already there when, when we moved here, well, so case, I mean, that's something you're aware yeah, of. Yeah, that'd be. You walked into that, but you're, you're off. Is Except there, we can't see the water towers. We can't see the radio tower where it is now because it's next uh, way at the end of the street, mm-hmm. but they're moving it down the street. Well, that's, the guy, the, the, the people who are up the street are happy as clams, aren't they? Oh, exactly. It's moving away from them. So <laughs> I think this is one that you're going to either learn to live with or unhappily have to relocate. And I don't think that the chances of you getting any, any compensation, I think, are very, very remote. Just part of the, the nature of urban living, I guess. I'm Bruce Williams. Good luck, honey. This is TalkNet. TalkNet. 1-800-743-8000. Let's go to New York, New York. I'm not going to sing it, but I'll be glad to say hello. How are you? Hi, Bruce, and how are you doing? I am well. Man, it's great to be able to talk to you. I've been listening to your show now for quite a few years, especially out of the Caribbean. Oh, where did you and, listen down there? Uh, Antigua, Montserrat. Oh. Dominica and some of the other islands. We're listening tell out, you. out of San Juan. Yeah, hey, we listen to you out of WOSO out of w- San Juan. Indeed, Augie, you, Augie Station. You got a great following in the Caribbean, I must tell you that. Well, thank Not you. Not only in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, but in the other British-speaking Caribbean as well. Uh huh. You've got quite a following. Unfortunately, we don't have 800 numbers to reach you yet. That's well, <laughs> they don't work down there, huh? They don't work down there. Uh, I know they work from Puerto Rico. I didn't yeah, know. Puerto Rico and St. Thomas. Okay, Bruce. Now I have recently relocated here to. The United States to New York to be exact mm-hmm. and uh, in the Caribbean we haven't got the credit system and uh, I have been recently trying to get myself credit cards get established and all of that surely but I am having a problem a real problem well in let's that, look go ahead in that um, I have applied to some of the major credit card companies and um, I've all I've gotten back letters from them telling me well you know we haven't been able to find any trace of your credit history. NCH, like no credit history. No credit history. Um, they recommended I try a few department stores to get something established there, but every time I go to the department stores, I've asked if I've got a visa or a MasterCard. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so well, what this, do I do? Well, this is what the collateralized credit cards are all about. You've okay. heard them advertised on this program mm-hmm. and elsewhere. There, I think there are 17 banks in the country now that are doing it. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's all about. Uh, you make a deposit in the bank... Uh-huh. And you receive interest on your deposit, but you may not withdraw that money. It's held hostage. Okay. And then the your credit limit is uh, either essentially or is actually, depending on the bank that you choose, the amount of money that you put on deposit. If you okay. put $1,000, you get a $1,000 credit line, 5000 I mean, whatever. Uh-huh. And that's one way to get your foot in the door because when you walk in uh, with a credit card uh-huh. in the department store, Unless they take the time and effort to find out, and some will and many will not. Yeah. Uh, they can get screwed. No, it's not that at all. Mm. What I'm saying is that you got a credit card, you can have a Visa card. Okay. Or a MasterCard. And that is one credential to help you along the way of getting one of their in-store cards. Okay. And if you use that periodically and pay it in a timely fashion, now you got a couple things on your credit file. Okay. And it, it just has to be fertilized and it grows. Okay. But the, that's the collateralized credit card is made for someone like yourself. Okay. No credit history. Do you have a decent income? Yes. How much, how much are you earning? I'm a news correspondent with 35. Okay, eight. fine, fine. You have no problem in that regard. Uh, you shouldn't have, that, that's the way you build it up. Okay. It is a, you know, they, they've almost adopted, not almost, they have adopted a posture that no credit is worse than bad credit. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's I'm, what I discovered. <laughs> well, welcome to the crate. What you say, your news correspondent? Yes, I am, Bruce. For what a, a wire service or? Yes. yes Which sir. one? The West Indies News Network. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. And you go you and you feed the uh, the local uh, and the Caribbean as well. The information about New York. Yeah. What with the Caribbean slant? Uh, something like that. That's really interesting. Mm hmm. I didn't. I, I know my column appears in Aruba. I'm, I'm sure of that. Yeah. Because I do get some mail from Aruba from time to time. Okay. And it also appears in San Juan, the San Juan Star. Uh huh. But I didn't realize that there was a Caribbean uh, news organization as such. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess um, we can probably talk a little more about that when you have the time. There you go. I got one final question now. Okay. Why would you leave the Caribbean to live in New York? Uh, well, it's part of the life of a newsman. Everybody wants to know what's happening all around. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> and I guess they send you all over the place. <laughs> I think you got the short end of that one. <laughs> I do wish you well. Thanks, Bruce. Take care. And keep care. up the great work. Thank you. Okay, much. good. Bye bye. Portland, Oregon, it's your turn. Hello there. Welcome to TalkNet. Hi, Bruce. Hello. I'm hoping you can help me here. Um, we bought a house about six months ago. And my husband has a little office, and his neighbor in the office is an interior decorator. Mm -hmm. And she said, hey, you know, get your curtains and window coverings from me. I'll get you a great price, and I won't charge you a consultation fee. Well, how nice. Yeah, I thought so. So we went ahead and did that, and, and um, they turned out okay. And then she said, you need some prints in here. You need something on your walls. So I said, well, you know, we really don't want to spend that much money. And she said, hey, for what I'm going to do... This is going to be an heirloom you can hand down to your daughter. You could never do this by yourself. You are going to love it. Yeah, I'm going to love it. Mm -hmm. And so I picked out the print, and, you know, she knew that we needed a really big one because we have a 20-foot wall, and she knew, you know, that I had certain colors in my house because she'd been out to the house. How big a print did you buy? Oh, it turned out to be very small. It was supposed to be big, you know, and she oh. told me a couple of them. Oh, that's too small, that's too small. How big is big and how small is it? Oh, big? it's probably 28 by 32. And that's going on a 20-foot wall? Yeah, but, but she said, you guys need a table under it. So I said, well, you know, we really don't want a table. She said, well, you need one. So <laughs> By anyway. golly, you need it. <laughs> <laughs> we needed it really oh, what's bad. What's wrong with you, man? I mean, <laughs> here, listen, you, <laughs> shoot, so, need a table. Oh, man. Maybe even two. Hey, that's right. I should have got about three pictures for that wall. But anyway, so she said, your print... How about a big old Indian rug or a tapestry? <laughs> I'm serious. They look lovely. Well, not not in my living not room. Not in your not, not with pinks and purples. But anyway, so <laughs> she says the I'm print... Sorry. I didn't say what I was thinking. Guard. <laughs> she said the print is in. It's gorgeous. So I went in to look at it, and the gal said, well, it's being framed. And I thought... Hold it. I thought, well, wait a minute, I'd like to kind of see it, because I, you know, I'm not very good at choosing things from swatches and from little, you know... Boy, you and I can hold hands on. Oh. I don't see how people do that. Please. I've made I've made many mistakes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so um, I thought that, you know, I had mentioned that I liked a frame that she had out in the hall, and so I said, is it going to be just like this? And she said, yes, and it has a beautiful matting, and it's just gorgeous, mm -hmm. and I'm paying a lot for this print, so I'm expecting this. Just uh, how much are you paying for this print? Well, 230 which oh. isn't a lot to well, the public. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don't that a great money. Yeah, what? okay. Well, it's a lot to us, and she knew it. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, she calls me and says, it's in, it's beautiful, and my husband's being next door, brought it home, and it, the print is nice, but it's very, very small. It's got all the wrong colors. The framing's terrible, and the only neat thing she did on the framing was mm. one white mat. Well, that is not exactly a good reason to buy a print. Oh, well, it I mean, just, that would go back so fast that your heart would skip a beat. Well, so, it, so I had my husband take it back to her. Right. And she said, well, you know, we could do... This and that and this and that. It's going to be another seventy-five dollars for this, another fifty for this. Look, without regard, you don't like it. A piece of uh, uh, when you start to talk about a piece of art, which is what a print is. Uh huh. It's subjective as crazy. Well, that's what I thought. And if, if you like it, I've got stuff I'm sure you wouldn't put in your cellar in the dark. Right, right. And I have to believe that there might be one or two things in your home that I wouldn't have wild enthusiasm right. for. But that's what art and that's what taste is oh, all about. Oh, but th this gets better, Bruce. You're going to well, like it. I'll tell you what. When we get back, you can explain the, the better parts. Fair enough. Hang on to that emotion. I'm Bruce Williams. This is TalkNet. I'm talking with the lady in Portland, Oregon, 
She's beside herself, and I can understand that. The a friend dealing with friends, interior decorator or business associate of her husband, has now sent over a print which has uh, a certain lack of of attraction. How's that? Is that a nice way to put it? That sounds okay. much better than it really is. All right. So um, now what happened? Here's the good part. So I said, you know, I can't spend any more money on this. Well, so she's all bent out of shape, and she tells my husband, you know, look, you guys ordered this. You have to pay for it. And Chris not knowing, you know, my husband not knowing um, everything that's gone on. It's a, it's a really long story. I'm leaving some things out. I took it back yesterday, and she wasn't in. I talked to her office partner. I gave them a check for the print because I felt bad because I did have her order the print. I said, I'll give you the money for the print, $30. You go ahead and keep everything. Try to sell it yourself. What, what's the thirty dollars for? For the print itself, the framing was two hundred. Oh, I thought the whole just the print itself was two something. No, 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 no. Oh, all right. So it is less expensive than you thought. So I, um, I said, you know, I just don't like it. It's not big enough, and everything. It's not me. It's That's all. You exactly. shouldn't have to apologize that, or explain oh, that. Oh, oh. So the office partner was real nice about it. You know, she said, well, maybe we could think about something else. Da da da. Well, anyway, I go back into my office. Ten minutes later, here comes the interior decorator. She says, come out here. Get out here, you rascal. Yeah. So I go out there, and she says, this check is not enough. You write me a check right now for this full amount. I can't afford to pay for your framing, and just rake me over the coals like you can't And you listen to it? Well, I said, no, I'm not going to pay for it. And she said, there will be a collection agency on your door tomorrow. But, Bruce, she has the print. Well, it's fine. I mean, she's going to have a collection agency after me, and she has the print? Well, that's all right. Let her have it. Let her, you know, the collection agency after you doesn't mean they're going to get any money. Yeah, but I don't want to wreck my credit or oh, anything. Oh, now hold it. What is your first name? I'm Betsy. Betsy, up until now, you and I could hold hands. Okay. But as soon as you start this, oh, my goodness, I'm intimidated. They're going to wreck my credit. You, you just surrendered before they fired a shot. Well, that's what my husband said. But I didn't say that to her. I told her, go ahead, I'll sue you. That's what I told her. So she doesn't know I'm kind of shaking in my boots here. Well, maybe she does, maybe she doesn't. Okay. But the fact is that uh, if you were talking about something that was custom made for you... Well, it was. Well, no, it wasn't. The matting can be used again, and so can the frame. Okay. Uh, then the, certainly the print wasn't custom made for you as well. That's true. She just and, bought... And, further, for and furthermore, when, when one buys things of that nature, unless... You examined the print ahead of time and so forth. Did you do that? No. I saw it in a book. All right. I, I don't think that, that she has a whole bunch. And furthermore, for the kind of money that you were describing, uh, she can put all the collection agencies she wants. I know what you have to do is say we have a disputed claim. And if you can if you can get a court of proper jurisdiction to agree with you, then perhaps you have a possibility of collecting. But until that time, and in such that time happens, leave me alone. Mm-hmm. Now, they may call you from time to time. But, I mean, this lady is patently unreasonable. Yeah. But even if she has the print, I mean, so you don't think she has any... I would... I, could, I No, look, I can't look into a judge's head. Yeah. And you never know how these things will come down. Yeah. But I think your position is far and away the most reasonable. Okay. I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it. I have and been. for pity's sake, don't lose any sleep over your credit rate. <laughs> I wish you well, sweetheart. Thank you. It has been a joy. Good hour, guys. I thank you for it. I'm Bruce Williams for TalkNet. Welcome to my world. Welcome to Talk Dead. Now, I know a lot of you guys and gals are hurtling down the highway. That's okay. But do me a kindness, huh? Buckle up that seatbelt. Give the other guy a little bit of a break, because I can't afford to lose you. Yeah, that's true. I'm Bruce Williams. Welcome, my friends. Welcome to Talk Dead. Telephone number is 800-743-8000. I do hope one of these days, like Kansas City, you'll be my guest. On TalkNet. Hello there. Hi, Bruce. Hi. I'm a two-time offender with calling your show. First time was a, a four years ago, and you helped me immensely, so here I am again. I had a, a water softener in my basement um, flood my 46 by 14 family room. Did it um, for about three weeks every 
79 at 2 in the morning without my knowledge. Well, it was flooding your family room at 2 o'clock? Yeah, when, when, it, regenerated. when, when it regurgitated, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, didn't, didn't you get a message the next morning? No, because we hardly ever go down there. Oh. We have a ranch, so we stay upstairs a lot. And uh, How long was this going on before somebody went down to either do the cleaning or the laundry or something? Well, uh, everything's upstairs, and we just went downstairs to let the dog out one time. Huh. And. Uh,